Hey, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. It's really good to see you all here. Um, this is your Ask Jack workshop. And um, usually what we do is at the start of these workshops, um, we uh, open the floor for any topic in nature journaling that you are struggling with and people will put that into the chat. Today we're going to start by, and this may take all of our time, um, I wanted to share some of my journal entries from the expedition to the Galapagos Islands and show you um, those. And I also had some, some interesting, um, I used a few journaling strategies that I think you will find useful and wanted to, to share those with you. And then we might have time for any other things. Um, while we're waiting for a few other people to sign on and uh, people are warming up and getting any tools they want to take notes, um, want to introduce our amazing co-host, adding spotlight, there she is. It's Evea Moore, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, uh, everybody, uh, uh, we're really happy to be here with you today. Um, Vea, hello, hello, hello. Oh, you've got, um, is that the, uh, are you looking at this? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Um, up, um, is that a patterns in nature book? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Oh, that is, that is such an interesting, interesting, uh, book there. Yes. That's. <laughs> That's cool. Like for for we who seek patterns, <laughs> this is this is you know it's it's neat to see the way that that person did sort of some deep geeking out with thinking about this. I like. You had you had held up this book for me. Um, oh, Valerie's also got uh, Valerie. I'm going to bring you on. Uh, add spotlight and allow you to unmute yourself. Um, you also uh, have got some stuff on patterns and designs in nature. That looks like an interesting read there. This is kind of um, really a cool book. I thought it was the same thing you had, Ivea, but it, it is different. It has a lot of variety. Anyway, the oh. author is, um, yeah, it's just a compilation of all different um, people, I guess. So it's, Oh yeah, I, I, probably it's it's old sort of uh, uh, illustrations from from books that are kind of compiled together in in similar. Uh, oh, that is really fun. That's the back. I bought it used. <clears throat> the best way. The best yeah. way. Yeah, the patterns in nature book is about um, sort of large, uh, you know, like a, sort of large patterns that occur across all sorts of different um, di different categories. And, you know, like, you know, sort of thinking of like, what is the, what is the geometry behind how things, you know, as things are packing together, what geometries are created, as things are expanding, as things are coming together, as things are networking, what are our typical patterns that are, are coming together? Um, how, how do meanders work um, and what are, how can you find what is the structure behind some things that might at first to us appear to be chaotic, but when you really see the geometry behind it, um, it really are, 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 are elegant. I think that it's a, that's a cool read. Thank you for showing us that book, Valerie. Um, so, uh, Avea, before we jump into the Galapagos journals, what uh, has been going on in your world and what is happening with uh, the land of nature journaling? Have you uh, done any journaling out on your restoration site recently? Yes, I have. And I had a blast. It was wonderful. Um, I decided to use a different notebook and then I just kind of went for it um, and sketched faster than I thought I would for one thing, a little bit longer for another. And then I decided it was OK if the field capture looked a bit weird. I just was so happy just getting to sit there and stare at this place that I love. Um, so it's less about the outcome and more about having the experience in the first place. And I'll, I'll be able to share that during sharing time. So my recent journal entries with the restoration and with some other stuff. Um, we're going to lead, lead with that. OK. 
<laughs> Last time um, you didn't get a chance to share it, but we really want to see what's happening in those 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 journals too. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and as for things happening, um, so tonight is a really, really special event. Um, if you already have this book, um, then all you have to do is present your receipt to Heyday Books, I believe it is. There's some details on Jack's website and as well as on um, the Nature Journal page, the um, Facebook page. But there is this amazing fire, um, sort of somebody who, who investigates the fire and the effects on this place and also the effects of change over time by the name of Robin Lee Carlson. Um, and she and Jack are going to be doing a workshop tonight for anybody who might have this book. So further details are on Jack's website. Um, the community calendar is right here. Um, tomorrow morning, we have, um, we have plant families in our foods, week eight. The, those of you who were there yesterday already <laughs> know in advance how crazy it's going to be for our group tomorrow morning. So we apologize in advance for the gloomiest family that I'll be showing you. And Jack knows exactly what that means. And um, <laughs> and then after that, we have Rebecca Rolnick, the amazing Rebecca Rolnick, who you might have heard of. She used to do writing workshop Wednesdays. She currently does restoriation. Um, and tomorrow she is leading our Nature Journal Educators Forum for a discussion of strength-based learning meeting participants where they already are strong um, and also increasing their self-confidence doing that. So that should be tomorrow. Um, she is an incredible teacher. So it, you don't have to just be an educator to come to these. I recommend anybody do, especially if it's a chance to learn from Rebecca Rolnick. Um, also tomorrow evening, Marley Pfeiffer will be having another of, of, of his episodes. It's going to be about um, the Galapagos, but it's followed by something special. So for the first 15 or 20 minutes or so, it will be his, his footage of the Galapagos, followed by a live stream with him, where he would like to read your comments in the chats, um, so that, that way he can hear from you all what you use your nature journals for. Um, you can also write to him in advance if you don't think you'll be able to make it. Um, but he encourages folks to show up and, and just be there in person with him. Um, I think last I checked, he was in the cloud forest. So <laughs> you might be able to see some of his surroundings, which are extremely pretty. Um, Thursday, we have Pencil Miles and Chill at its usual eight. And then we're here with Jack to talk about birds in flight, which I'm very excited about. Um, and then on, and then also on that evening, we have Trisha. No, no, actually, no, I'm wrong. We do not. Trisha is on vacation until the 25th. So she's not going to be there tomorrow, but it's a great time to watch some awesome reruns, especially some of the cool bugs we've done recently with her. She's Insectopia um, on YouTube, and you can also find her, um, her information on Jack's community calendar as well. Um, Saturday, Pencil Miles and Chill at its usual three o'clock. Um, and then I believe it, from Jack's calendar, it looks like you're off next week. So... Uh, yeah, I, I will be a, away from uh, internet access, I'm afraid. In that case, I wish Jack a good week without internet. And I wish all of us the same. Run from the Zoom. <laughs> and um, having said that, I think we, it's time we dive into Jack's Galapagos journals and, and a bit more about his experience there. And we're really happy that you're all here with us today. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, also, thank you so much, Avea, for uh, helping helping uh, take care of this community and let people know what are the, um, the, 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 the possibilities of connecting with other people. Um, so <clears throat> uh, if you're uh, not able to, if you're not able to join us tomorrow, that would be a dilemma. That's for you, Ava. All right. Uh, now, um, I recently got back from a nature journaling adventure in the Galapagos Islands. And it was not, my, my experience was not what I expected. Um, and uh, the, here's, here's the, uh, the, 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 the spoiler to the story is that um, shortly into the trip, um, I developed the symptoms for COVID <laughs> and, and that, that, that is a game changer. And so I wanted to um, share you with you the journal before that, during that, and then after. Um, so <laughs> didn't quite get to the islands I thought I would. Um, and for a while there, I saw a lot of a motel room. Um, so <laughs> 
Um, so let's bounce over to. Um, bum, 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 bum. Oops, wrong button. Uh, here we go. All right. Um, so these are the Galapagos Islands, um, and they sit off the coast of Ecuador. They're a part of Ecuador. Um, and Ecuador is named for the equator, which runs through Ecuador and also runs through the Galapagos Islands. Um, so if you imagine sort of the middle of a globe, um, you know, making a little map of, of where you're going to be going or where you are is a really fun idea. It um, kind of helps us spatially orient ourselves. And this is something that you can put in, in any page of, of a journal. And, um, you know, when people meditate, they try to kind of orient themselves to place and time. Um, this is my, my version of that. So this is orienting myself to place. And this is orienting myself to, whoops, here we go. This little timeline along the bottom here um, is, is uh, me orienting myself towards time. And you're going to see that that ends up being really important for some logistics <laughs> that I was uh, having to, 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 uh, to, to follow. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to, um, I, we are, this was with a group of nature journalers and we arrived in Quito the next day we went out to the Galapagos Islands. The next day we, the group starts exploring different islands. And then we're going to hop on an airplane and fly to mainland and um, go up into the cloud forest. Um, but if you can see here, on this day here, I develop a slight dry cough. And I'm wondering, but back here in the United States before I left, I got myself a PCR test to make sure that I didn't, when I was in, coming back from Africa, didn't contract COVID and I had a negative PCR test. So at this point, I don't have COVID. This point, I'm starting a little slight dry cough, and the next morning, I test positive. So more on that in a moment. But let's take a look at what happened before, before that. So flying in uh, on the airplane, um, I got a window seat. Uh, whenever you can, get a window seat, because um, then you can look out your window. And this was coming over the Gulf of Mexico. There were these strange blobs that were kind of blown out like this. And I realized partway through, or I should say, I strongly suspect these were oil slicks that I was looking down on in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, here's the size of a cargo ship for scale. So these were pretty large slicks out there. And for miles and miles, I was seeing those. and really made me think about what the um, uh, sort of our, you know, as I am flying using fossil fuels, here is something that is from, um, here is a product, sort of the, 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 the byproduct or another effect of our harvesting the oil. And there I am, on an airplane using fossil fuels, it really made me think of like, what is my relationship between that and where I am? The other thing I thought was kind of cool, I was seeing these, these little clouds in rows and I was sort of thinking about um, what is going on making those clouds appear in little lines down below me. And this is a little diagram, oops, this is a little diagram of what I thought was going on. And also the clouds had this sort of lean to them. Um, you can see that the base was out on one side and it made me wonder if, if winds were coming along like this, if there's higher speed winds up high, lower speed winds down low, that would make clouds lean. Didn't know, but um, you know, it's, it's fun to kind of look out your window and wonder and philosophize. Um, so, the um, land in Quito 
and are driven to a little hotel and walked outside the hotel and went for a little walk. Um, they found this one little bird that was um, popping up to entertain me. And what I really started to get into were spiders. <laughs> These two really cool spiders. Um, this one making a horizontal web and um, this one um, making a web at, so here's a side view of the web kind of at a different angle. So here's views of the spiders. Here are um, also just sort of a little thing kind of showing the orientation of the web. Made me really, really think about that I don't have a really good vocabulary for describing um, the details of spider webs. And it made me want to really geek out more on spiders and understand the structure of spider webs in a way that I can accurately record them in my journals with less fuss. So that will be coming. I'm going to develop a class on drawing spiders and spider webs that um, to, to, cause this, this little bit of geeking out made me realize like, I, I just, I don't, I've got the visual tools for understanding kind of like, Oh, there's a bird. I'm going to record information about that. But um, this is this is different. Um, the other thing that um, I started to happen in my journals, my daughters sent with me um, a little puppet <laughs> of a, a harbor seal named Morp, and um, they were uh, they really wanted me to include Morp in my journal. Um, making commentary about things because in their journals they have they've developed these little icon characters um, that sort of somewhat represent themselves and what they're thinking and sometimes a little bit of the personality of their little icon. So I started putting those in my journals for my daughters, but I actually found it a really useful way of just getting myself to on a regular basis sort of think about how am I feeling about this and I could express it through more. Um, so this idea of having a little um, kind of, it's essentially, it's a, this is a, a harbor seal shaped emoji that um, is also reflecting on, um, reflect, re reflecting on kind of the, the events that are, are going on. And I'm, I'm actually, since I got back, I've continued to drop a few morphs into my journals. Um, I, I, I find that's, that's, that's useful. So then the next day we fly to past all these volcanoes to the Galapagos islands. And, um, I'm Jack, sorry to interrupt Jack. It's, it's, um, it's having a little bit of trouble. Oh, focusing. it is. Well, it needs some focus, focus help. Um, let me see if I can. Oh, it looks perfect now. That's it good. Looks, yeah. All right. So, the at the airport at the airport where you land in the galapagos islands you are met by ambassadors of the islands so this is a little galapagos finch that was hopping around right in the airport <laughs> and so that was just right from the start um it, the, uh, it, it's happening. Also, as we walked off the, the walked along the, 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 the jetway, we were seeing these land iguanas plopped out. Um, it was the sort of best jetway experience. You, this little covered walkway and you're walking to pick up your luggage. And as you do, you're looking out and you're seeing the, you're seeing land iguanas right and left. I couldn't stop there and sketch them because then I would have stopped everybody from getting their bags and I would not have been popular. Um, so then we, we get on our boat and um, these could are, you, um, sorry, Jack, could you move up a little? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We hop on our boat. And so this is starting to just do birds in flight from the boat. And um, the, this was, um, it's, it's, it's really useful to make for when you're doing birds in flight to not be really too self-critical when you're getting started because drawing birds in flight is weird. And, but you just keep making them and you'll see that as, as they go on, you know, later on that day, they're looking even more like, like, like the birds. Um, from uh, right when we take off, we look out, we can see the island of Daphne Major, 
Um, if anybody has read The Beak of the Finch or is familiar with the research of the Grants, um, that's the island where they did all that incredible research on um, change through time on the shapes of the, 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 the beaks of the finch. Um, and so here's just, um, I was also working on kind of quick, quick landscape ethos of, of, of the islands that were out there. And then we make it onto our first island and oh boy, there are all these nesting birds. So these are frigate birds on the nest. Um, land iguana scat, real size. Um, so imagine that coming out of a lizard. Wow. Um, more is reminding me to follow the rules on the island. Um, oh, this was also kind of fun. This was uh, just a little reminder to me that in the airport, um, before you get your bags, this dog runs out and it smells everybody's suitcase. <laughs> and, um, so while you're standing there, before you pick, can pick up your suitcases, you have to wait for the dog to go and smell everybody's suitcase. Oh, that's kind of neat. But look at this. So here are blue-footed boobies. Here's a month-old blue-footed booby chick. Um, so this is a ballpoint pen sketch with throwing a little bit of white colored pencil on it to kind of bring out some of the, just the, 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 the absolute fuzz that was these things. Really, really neat birds. So a few ballpoint pen sketches. And then these were frigate birds that were sitting on the nest. And the, um, so there's two species of frigate birds. There's magnificent frigate birds and great frigate birds. The, the differences between them are fairly subtle. But when you see them side by side, maybe 10 feet away, um, it's, you can pick those out. You can get things like, like, oh, you have a pink ring around your eye. You don't. No, um, but check out these displays. So the, the, the um, male frigate birds who have a partner, so this one is sitting on the nest next to its partner, and they were kind of cuddling, little frigate birds snuggle. Um, it's sitting there with its wing draped over her back, and then it's got its big pouch here um, puffed up and it's slowly rocking it back and forth. So I'm putting in this little curvy arrow, whoop, sort of using these curvy arrows to show that, kind of to show movement in these things. Um, Mama Great Frigate Bird comes in to feed the chick and the chick stuffs its head right down her throat. And um, they actually have to do this because um, the, there are other frigate birds around that if you were just to regurgitate your food in front of the chick, then the other frigate birds would come by, they would snatch that food away and from right in front of the chick. And uh, so this is a good way of just making sure that your food gets to your babies. And um, then here is a land iguana. So there are land iguanas and marine iguanas on the Galapagos Islands. And they've got a common ancestor, but um, have been separated for, for quite a while. The land iguanas are these big, just super chunky things with more of a rounded tail, um, but they're sitting, you know, maybe five feet off the trail. And so you can just walk down the trail and sit down on the trail and this little thing is right in front of you. So I had a chance to kind of zoom in on that. Um, here's just a little bit more, you know, fun with these nesting birds. So blue-footed boobies with their chicks, great frigate birds, on nests with their chicks. These ones nest on the ground. These ones build these nests in these little low shrubs. So they're, <clears throat> well, they're in the tops of the, the shrubs, but the shrubs are maybe a foot tall. 
So he's, it puts all these birds right at eye level. And um, uh, so here is a uh, black crowned night heron napping blue footed boobies. It was just a wonderful chance just to draw and sketch. And also here are some sea lions, these Galapagos sea lions that uh, have no fear of people and they're just, you have to step around them. They'll just nap right in the middle of the trail. That was a big, big, big fun. Oh, there's a question here about, yeah. about um, if you could explain the sniff. Oh, the sniff here. Oh yeah, what this is, there is a tree called incense tree that was there and its sap is actually used to make incense. So if I scratch this, here, uh, smell that. You smell it? Um, I rubbed the sap of the tree into the journal and let's see if it's still giving off. I'm still actually getting a little bit a hint of the scent of it. So I'm trying to make my journal a little bit, have a little scratch and sniffed element. Um, so this is, you know, all the same day, right? So, you know, this is, this is the, 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 the 17th, all walking around on this island. Um, there's just so much to do here. Here's, um, and then we hop in our our boat, and we're um, we're now. Then we 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 take off to 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 uh, go to Sombrero Chino, um, our our next little visit for that day. Um, and on the way here. Um, uh, I'm just getting in some kind of quick landscape sketches, really just emphasizing the, the shapes of these little islands, the values of things. This is gouache. The light value stuff is gouache. The dark here is watercolor. And so those two work very well on toned paper. Um, as we are uh, steaming along, Frigate birds are following the boat, so you can walk up onto the back of the boat, and they're just soaring without having to flap right behind, right behind the boat. Um, saw a greater flamingo fly by. We knew that um, in a few days we would get to um, uh, another island where we get to see a big colony of flamingos. Um, and so actually, yeah, so this is, this is then, so that evening, next morning, we're, we wake up and here's this little island right in front of us. And hold on, I'm going to check something back here. Yes. All right. So this morning, we get out, oh yeah, here's also um, more sort of morning light on the islands. This is, again, the light value here is gouache and the dark is watercolor. Oh, I apologize, the, oh, there we go. We get onto this island and there are, um, there are Galapagos hawks. It's a species of hawk that looks a little bit like an immature red tail. Um, and it has, like many other critters, it's got no fear of human beings. And so it just, you know, sat on the rocks, watched us walk right past, didn't feel that it needed to, to take flight. Um, and so as we walk past it, we're getting these different views and different angles of it. Really beautiful, beautiful bird. Little um, map showing the island where we're going to visit. Um, and then here's another type of lizard. Each island, let's zoom down on this, each island has its own varieties of lava lizards. They're the same species, but um, they, um, there are slight differences in the patterns of them from island to island. So you can actually pick up one of the lizards um, 
you're not supposed to pick up the things, but hypothetically, one could pick up one of the lizards and say like, oh, this one came from this island, this one came from this island. They're, they've got their own little differences. So exploring um, that in the morning, and then we hopped into the water between Santiago Island and uh, Sombrero Chino. And this are, these are memory drawings of the fish that were there. So um, I had all sorts of good intentions of, of coming up with an underwater sketching system and bringing that with me to the Galapagos and I just didn't get myself organized enough to do it. So I ended up doing memory drawings of the different fish that were down there and um, and found that it was really hard for me to remember the details of these different fish. And so there were a bunch that I forgot. And then these, these memory drawings, I know that there's a number of mistakes that are in these, because this was just sort of my, like, like what, what was going on with the fins on this thing? And, oh, so like the, um, well, um, like the uh, like the spiders, I think that I need to come up with some strategies of how do I kind of mentally map out fish. I've gotten better at doing it with birds, but I don't have much practice in these sort of things. So it was um, also interesting to be there in an environment where there was incredible diversity of things. Um, I, I really, really wanted to have an underwater sketching system. So next time I go back, remind me, I've got to get myself an underwater sketching system. You know, things like, you know, there's a little fish that was bright yellow on one end and blue on the other. And I think it was yellow by the head, but I'm really not sure. I mean, even, you know, gross things like that of like which, which end had the bright yellow. Hmm. And it's possible that one reason I was having trouble with my memory is because I couldn't do the production of, um, effect trick. And um, so I couldn't be saying out loud the details that I was seeing from these and hearing myself say it um, because I was snorkeling. Um, <clears throat> and then we make our way to the island of Bartolome. And so this is, I'm going to zoom down on this little sketch here, because this is, you may have, have seen, uh, this is sort of one of these incredibly photogenic islands. There's this, this spire, this incredible um, pinnacle. Um, um, and that is, um, uh, it, it just, it, from, from every angle, it's, it's fun to draw. So if you ever saw the movie Master and Commander, they, 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 this, this island, of course, they had to have in that movie. Um, and, uh, but you, you get there and you just, you feel just driven to sketch. Somehow a grasshopper has made it out to this little island um, and was there, it's old lava rock. Um, and this little grasshopper is made up there, just all sorts of bright colors. Really, I, I wonder if this is aposematic. So I wonder if this actually has any distasteful things in it so that things don't, you, you'd think that being that bright that everybody would want to eat you. Mm, don't know. We made our way up to the top of Bartolome. And at this point, I am, oops, here we go. So here's that looking down on that bay from a different angle. Um, And um, this is all on the other side, this massive lava flow that in, they think 1894, this, there was an eruption um, on this island here and the lava flowed all the way around here, around these little things. So if you had been sitting on one of these um, spots here, you would have watched lava flow down all around you. And uh, so that's on the neighboring island. So you're right next to Santiago Island, you're on Bartolome here very little, a small little channel between the two. 
And there's that cool spire again, again. But at this point, I'm starting to cough, I'm getting a, a, a cough that is stronger. And um, the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm masked at this point. The whole group is masked. Um, but there's this little tickle in my throat that is starting to grow. And I'm thinking, huh, what's up with that? Um, we, uh, on our way back to our boats, we uh, come around the little uh, cove here, and here are um, Galapagos penguins. So in addition to flamingos being on the Galapagos, there are penguins. And the penguins just sit there and they pose for you. They, they just so in their little penguin suits. Um, so they've got this cool little bar across their, their, their face, but they just, they sat there and they posed for us. It was really, really fun. Oh, here's another view of Bartolome. Oh. Uh, zoom, zoom. So this was from up on top of the island, looking down. The penguins were behind this little spire here. That's Santiago Island out behind you. Here you have little mangrove grove here, and uh, you're up on looking on top of uh, the kind of the lookout and looking down on where the pinnacle is. I really was enjoying putting little reference maps into these. And maps, if you have annotations in them of what you're seeing where, those maps become much more interesting and useful. Um, encountered a lava heron. Um, and oh, look, here's another view of that spire. Every time, you, every time you get a different view of that spire, the penguins were all hanging out right back here on the back side of that. So cool. And this is sort of fun. I decided to kind of have my sketches interact with my journal here. So here is the lava heron perched on top of my little sketch box. <clears throat> um, that was kind of fun to do. So a little tickle in my throat. Get back to the boat and I test myself. I'm negative. And so I think to myself, oh, no problem, nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. Um, and the next morning, I wake up and I am coughing more and coughing more. And so before I leave my room, I, um, I check myself again. And I don't know if you've had a chance to use these little rapid ID tests. If you are, have enough of a viral load to be symptomatic, these will show up to be positive. But if you don't have symptoms, they generally, they're not sensitive enough to pick it up. But I was coughing. Is my cough, did I catch a cold somewhere or is it COVID? So I test it and here's what you, you get is that if you, if you get a little test and um, there's a little vertical bar by the letter T, if you have, if you can see that, then your test, um, or, so, sorry, there's a, there's a T and there's a C. If there's nothing by the C, then you did your test wrong. So you need to at least put in enough liquid that the, 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 the C one lights up. And um, if you get something that looked like this with just the C bar, then you're happy. You don't have detectable COVID. But this is how my test looked that morning. And I just sat there in my cabin staring at this little thing. Ugh. And my, my cough had also by this point turned to sort of a, a strange high pitched cough. So it had a different sound to it than the, the, the deep chesty, <coughs> but this, this high pitched cough that I now, whenever I hear it, I go like, ruh -roh. Um, I recognize that. Um, so we are now off of Henovesa Island, um, also known as Bird Island. And I decide that this is when I need to start my isolation. I let Marley, my co-leader know that 
um, I can't come out of my room. Um, and um, so here's my symptom tracker. Um, temperature over time on the 18th, nothing. Um, the morning of the 19th, I am getting up. I have a 101 temperature. Um, so I'm tracking my, 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 my temperature over time. Um, my test results, mild headaches and back pains and aches. Um, Morp uh, also got COVID. So the two of us were in isolation together, my little Harbor Seal friend. And um, I decided, you know, I am just going to document what is going on physiologically with me. And also, um, um, also what, what are my feelings about that? Um, well, by the way, every once in a while, we're off Hanavesa, every once in a while, the, the boat was positioned in a place that was looking out to sea. But every once in a while, it would kind of turn, and I could see a little bit of Hanavesa Island. So this is on the 19th. Um, I've got COVID, but every once in a while, I had a window, and that window would look out, and I could see birds doing things. Um, and so this is the excitement and the drama that I'm seeing, seeing from my window. Um, and uh, so what, what do we have? We have blue-footed blue boobies flying by. Look at this cool thing. Um, this is a red-billed tropic bird with a long tail. Um, this is a frigate bird feeding. And so as it comes down, it goes numb and grabs fish off the top of the surface with its head. So as it comes by, its head flicks down and behind to grab that fish. So snap, and then this is the follow through here. So there's a little moment you can sort of see it with its head pointing backwards with a fish in its bill. And um, so look at this, look at this. Um, so here is a Nazca booby chasing a blue-footed booby. And the, uh, sorry, sorry, a red-footed booby. And then the Nazca booby grabs the red-footed booby and crashes it into the water. What's going on? And they struggle there. And then um, the red-footed booby escapes. But then a frigate bird comes in and attacks the Nazca booby that was still on the water. So why is this frigate bird going after this Nazca booby? And then um, another Nazca booby comes in, whoops, here we go, and drives off the frigate birdie, bird, and then this Nazca booby flies up out of the water. So I'm wondering, did this one here, did the red-footed booby catch a fish? Did the Nazca booby steal that fish here? And then was the frigate bird trying to get the fish from the Nazca booby? I don't know. But there's all of this drama and excitement um, happening outside your window when your boat is pointing in the right direction. But I didn't even want to go up on deck because, you know, there are... There, were, there, there are crew people who are working around. The rest of the people at this point are exploring around on the island. But I don't want to, A, spread my cooties all over the boat. And also, there are still boat, uh, the sailors who run the boat, walking around. And so if I encounter them, I don't want to uh, do this. So I'm trying to, so I'm doing everything from my room. And even though the rest of the people are, are on land and are doing something over here with getting up really close with all these different kinds of boobies, red-footed boobies, Nazca boobies, all these sorts of things, um, I, 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 I don't want to do that. And so this is, there were some moments where I kind of, you know, pop up for some nature. I slept a lot. And it's interesting to kind of look at, I also kept track of my feelings and um, what I was um, doing. But I th thought it was that 
you know, maybe in these journals, also just kind of keeping track of my feelings is something that I want to do on a regular basis. Because this actually was really a powerful thing for me. Um, and just sort of, this was on the 20th. So this, this was the next day, right? <clears throat> so 19th was the day, here's the 19th. The next day, the 20th, um, I'll read you those feelings in just a moment. So I, in the morning, I look out my window and there's this, uh, there's this little sign of hope kind of outside the window, this coming down and we're off uh, Santiago Island. And I'm looking out and I can see these little volcanic domes and these cliffs. There are petrels that are, are, are uh, on the water in front of me. Petrels are this really interesting bird. What petrels do is they will, um, they hunt by hovering over the water and with their little feet, they dap their little feet, almost like they're walking on top of the water. So petrels are actually named petrels after St. Peter, who was supposed to have walked on water. So they're the walk on water birds. So there's some petrels out there. Here's another little dancing petrel. Um, that rainbow made an even bigger arc um and so here are this is the 20th um here were my thoughts on the 20th um i felt lonely i say i want to interact with people i'm frustrated i so want to be out there i feel like tantalus unable to quench his thirst or moses unable to go into the promised land. I'm worried. I'm, I'm worried that someone else will get sick and that I could have been the vector. I'm curious, where, when did I get exposed? My guess is it, it, well, it had to be somewhere on that airplane flight. I was masked with an uh, N95 the whole time, but somehow it got through. I'm disappointed. I've been looking forward to this for years now. And I feel like I've let the group down, that I'm putting too much of a burden on Marley. I'm angry with myself for not recognizing this earlier and, 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 and isolating myself. And then I wrote, I'm so scared. Um, on the 20th here, I was coughing so much in my little room down there that I threw my back out. And uh, it was scary. It was really scary. But it's interesting for me now to kind of look back at this column of those feelings and, and think about what, um, it really helps me remember, you know, our, our, our journals help us remember the, the little nature moments that we see. Um, but this sort of internal dialogue, I'm so thankful that I did that. Because um, our brains forget stuff like this. Um, that afternoon, we went on to another island. Um, this one has these, this big uh, red cinder cone of, and and it erodes into this red sand beach. There are flamingos here. Um, and uh, I was, was on the boat. Um, but as we were coming in for a little bit, I could see part of these cliffs. Um, and the next day, which is the 21st, um, so there, here we are leaving that, that, that island that night. So my, I get a little view out my window of Rabda Island as we, as, as, we, as we go away from it. For most of the day here, my boat was, my, my window was pay, uh, facing away from the island. So I couldn't really, I couldn't really see what was going on there. 
Um, but I like this little sunset sketch. And again, this is, I think, the power of um, the power of the, the the gouache, that purple, that orange there, these light blues. That's all gouache, and it really does a a very good job of giving you these light values. The next morning, I wake up and I look out my window and I see this. <clears throat> we have come to Santa Cruz Island, and this is this is one of the big islands. There's a hospital here. There are the other islands had. Um, Nobody's, uh, can, no, nobody's living on them. But on this island, um, there are cities and roads and, and cars and a little hospital. And there are hotels. And so the group that I'm with goes off to visit Darwin Station, which is a research center. And... Um, then off to the highlands to go look for tortoises um, in, the, in the field. And um, Morp and I are going to take this opportunity to check ourselves into a hotel. So um, we're, we're, we're checking ourselves into a hotel, um, but um, they're not able to kind of get me transport to there um, safe transport for a little while. So I've got time to sort of sit in my room, um, did this drawing of what was outside my room, and also had time to kind of check in with myself. Um, and, oh, look, this is looking out the other window. Look at the color of that water. A little, this beautiful, beautiful tropical water. Um, what I wanted to do is to read you the feelings of waking up this next morning. And, um, and there's a shift. There's a shift that happened that night. Um, the day before was really my load. So I got a, still got a little bit of a sore throat. Um, my fever is coming down. Um, and so feelings on the 21st. Gratitude for those who take care of me, bring me food and water to my door. For Marley, for stepping up and carrying the trip. For science and my vaccination. That means I probably will not die. For every breath. Others were not so lucky. For my window, a glimpse of the world. What would that time have been like if I didn't have that window? But just being thankful for the fact that there was a window in that little room, and sometimes I could see out. Maybe it wasn't, I would have preferred that the boat would point in a different direction. But I had had, the, I had, had that window. For the group whose laughter I can hear as they go exploring in wonder and joy. For clean air, cool fruit, the... They would bring me sometimes cool fruit, and it felt so good on my throat. For a life rich with family, friends, and wonders, and grateful that it was me and not a participant who got, uh, if somebody had to get sick, they got sick on that trip. I mean, what an interesting, um, what an interesting shift that on the 20th, it was, I was lonely, I was angry, I was frustrated, I was worried, I was, I was disappointed, I was scared. And then the next day waking up and just feeling such deep gratitude and being aware of all the things that, mm, all the things that I have to be grateful for. Um, the Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh once wrote about when you have a sore throat, I mean, not a sore throat, a, a toothache, 
all you can be aware of is just your how awful it is to have a toothache and how happy you would be if only you didn't have a toothache. And then the toothache goes away and you forget how wonderful it is not to have a toothache. And so he reminds us to be conscious of, to be aware of your non-toothache. That right now you don't have a toothache and just how wonderful that is. That right now you don't, you don't have COVID and what a blessing that is. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. This was um, just one day later. And, you know, being in, once I got started on this gratitude roll, <laughs> it, it started feeding on itself. And I started thinking of all the other things that I have to be grateful for. And just sort of reminds me of the importance of regularly checking in and being intentionally grateful in the world that we live in. And what are things that right now that I have that I am grateful for. And the more that I am intentional about those, it really does a dramatic thing in shifting our mindset. I really want to remember this lesson. I really want to remember this lesson. And I can apply it all sorts of places. I don't want to have to have COVID again in order to remember how much I have to be grateful for. So now <clears throat> I move from my boat with my window <laughs> to a hotel and outside the hotel window, there's this palm tree. This palm tree is right there. And I spend most of the day that day, the 21st sleeping. Um, but then everyone, so I, I woke up and I just had fun just exploring this palm tree. Realized palm trees are more challenging to draw than I thought. And I think I need to look into those more. Maybe do a class on drawing palm trees once I've kind of figured some things out. It makes me want to take a closer look at, at palm trees. Um, this was a coconut palm. Um, the next day... After that, I'm still in isolation. By the way, this this period, once you get once you get COVID, what you do is you trace it back to the point where you first had symptoms. Where symptoms appear, that is day zero. And if you have been asymptomatic, then the first day that you test positive is day zero. And so for the next five days, zero, one, two, three, four, five, you are in isolation. So, so you don't come, um, and so what a, a lot of people don't know is that sort of that day zero is, is, is to, to count that first day not as day one, that's day zero. And then for that full five days, I... Um, need to be in isolation. But then you can come out of isolation, but you cannot travel for the next five days. All right, so you can go around places with a mask on. Uh, what they find is that your viral load is, is really, really low. You're not infectious, generally speaking, but still, let's not get you on an airplane sitting shoulder to shoulder with other people. But you can go out and explore. So this uh, day five, I'm now on day five, or actually day four, yeah, day, so, so yeah, for day four, so I'm, here's day four and day five. I want to show you my day four and day five. Those, those were kind of weird. Day four, day four, this is most what I, um, this is what I did on day four. Um, I hardly got out of bed. For some reason, I was really dizzy, sick to my stomach, and and it was I was feeling really bad. If I kind of tried to walk around my room, I would also kind of get out of breath and 
it was something was 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 off here, and we we're starting to. I was uh, fortunately in contact with my wife, who's an infectious disease specialist, and um, we were trying to figure out if I was starting to have neurological symptoms of COVID, which can happen. So trying to you know really track this new set of symptoms, and if um, they continued the next day, we were then worried that there, I was, this was neurological symptoms of COVID. But the next day I woke up, sat up in bed, and I wasn't dizzy anymore. And um, another possible exploration, uh, explanation for it is it could have been diarrhea because I could have just been dehydrated. Um, but I was drinking a lot of water, um, but I was also losing a lot of fluid. So I'm kind of tracking all my symptoms over here on my little, my little, my, 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 my nausea, dizziness, and diarrhea graph. So this is actually a three-dimensional graph. Check that out. Um, so you have, um, you have time along the axis here. You have nausea here. That's another dimension. So nausea over time. You have dizziness over time and how that relates to it. And then I also am uh, sort of episodes of diarrhea, kind of tracking those. So just look at how much data you can get into one graph and kind of put those together. That's kind of cool. Um, color coding the nausea was green, right? And the dizziness was just the little purple line. So, hey, um, still thinking about visual display of quantitative information while sick. The next day I'm feeling better, but it's day four. Uh, no, uh, day five, I, I wake up, and um, what I do is I ask um, if they can take one of the flowers off the bush out in front of my hotel and leave that by my door. And they bring me a flower to my hotel room, and so I spend my day geeking, either sleeping <laughs> or geeking out with this really beautiful beautiful flower and i mean just look at how roughly this thing is this is the so side view it's got these crazy roughly roughly petals so i was using the trick to draw these of where i would hold it in front of me and i would close one eye and just look at this form here as a shape next to another shape, next to another shape. If I tried to think of like, what's going on with this sort of twisting, curling thing that was overwhelming for my brain. But I could kind of handle a shape next to a shape next to a shape, and it started to really take form when I um, then added color to it. Here's the, the, the looking down on it. I mean, the edges of it are crazy roughly. That was really fun. Um, and this is odd that there were these five sepals and then what I think were bracts uh, of Avea. Uh, you might be able to let me know that the little thing on the bottom had six parts and that part had five. I wanted to go check out others to see if others had five, but I didn't want to leave the room to, to go uh, see that. Um, Morp was really enjoying it, so we're now having a lot more fun. It's got this crazy cool... Uh, uh, style, that's the, the, the receptive, pollen receptive tip that had these five little beads. And then there's this column, whoop, this column of stamen um, that come up around it and a superior ovary down there. It was just this, uh, this one flower just helped me, helped me be happy this day. And I just sat there and I geeked out with this flower all day long. And it kept me in the last day of COVID isolation, kept me out of people's hair for day number five. And then the next day I could, if I mask, I can leave my motel room. Now, I can't travel on an airplane for the next five days. The rest of the group at this point is hopping on an airplane and flying to mainland Ecuador to go, <laughs> uh, 
to go uh, to an eco lodge up there and watch hummingbirds and toucanets and things like that. But I, I can't join them. However, um, I now have the next five days where I am on the Galapagos Islands and I can move around, right? So you can sort of see the, you know, the, the little Jack now just jumping up and down like, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, because there's been all this stuff that has been outside my motel room and um, I had my palm tree and this lovely, wonderful flower. But what happens if you now get to spend um, five days where you can't travel, but you can explore? All right. So I go for a walk up the street and I make my way. Um, so here's, here's, this, uh, here's this cool bird that I find. Uh, it's, a, it's a smooth billed Annie. Um, and it's this crazy kind of dinosaur looking black bird, um, striated herons. And I go out to an edge of a dock. I'm still kind of avoiding people, but um, I'm fully masked. But there is in the morning light, there's this group of marine iguanas that are sitting out by the edge of the dock. And I just sit down. Oh, I was, I was so grateful for this little group of marine iguanas. And um, I, I, I wept at <laughs> seeing marine iguanas and just being so lucky. And look what marine iguanas do. They go swimming around in the ocean, right? The, um, the, I think the, is it the males dive down and uh, females uh, eat in the, in the shallows and males go out further and dive. But this, this one would like a little surfer kind of goes swimming out, rides really high in the water. And they, then they duck underneath waves and oh, they're just so cool. Um, brown pelicans, um, got to spend a little bit of time with a group of those. And then look at this marine iguana palooza, right? So I made my way over to a beach and just sat there by myself on a beach surrounded by all of these iguanas. This is a Darwin's finch hanging out with the iguanas. And they were just so cool. And unlike other lizards that I'm familiar with, um, these ones spend their time, they love to kind of be in a big iguana love pile instead of being territorial. Um, and then went over to the Charles Darwin Research Center where they have a program where they've taken some um, turtles that people have, you know, taken off islands and use those as part of a breeding population to get um, turtle populations up um, on islands where they're really struggling. Look at this guy. I mean, look at this ridiculous tortoise, right? Um, they're, they're enormous. So I would be, um, if I were st had my feet on the ground next to this thing, my head would be about here. And that's how big this tortoise is, All right? So, <clears throat> and I sat there sketching tortoises and sketching tortoises and sketching tortoises and sketching tortoises and kind of getting a sense for, um, I, I learned some things about drawing the tortoises doing this. Um, towards the end, the sketches were kind of, I was getting these kind of cool angles and I realized what you wanted to do is really pay attention to what is the shape at the back end and what is the shape at the front end? Um, the stuff in the middle will kind of take care of itself, but you'll get these little cool angles that this, this, there's sort of this mud flap that they have on the back end. Um, what is the shape of the mud flap as you see that sort of turning around? If you can get that as it kind of turns around and this edge as it curves around, that's going to really, that's going to really help you. Um, made my way over to a mangrove lagoon. Um, and look at these roots that the red mangrove has, where it sends, it has these branches, but then it sends roots down from its branches and those root into the ground and they hold the branches up so the branches can stick out really far horizontally. 
this was a very complex system. And this is one of the things I wanted to show you folks is I now start using a lot of diagrams to record the details of complex systems. So look at this. You've got water down here. You've got high water line um, in this mangrove lagoon, low water line. Um, this, you know, you can see the cliff edge coming down here, the bottom of the water. This, if I just did a sketch, I'll show you a sketch of this lagoon later on. You can't really see the structure of it. But a little side view diagram like this, this is such, oh my gosh, this is such um, a powerful, powerful way to record information about what you're seeing. I'm writing in where I'm seeing different birds, where the yellow warbler was, where the striated herons were, where the ani is, what the, the, the leaves are doing. So it's this annotated side view diagram. I'll show you a few others of these in a little bit. But this, um, as I was out there, I was thinking like, wow, I'm getting so much more information about this place. It's really helping me look at this place in a very, very different way. So I want to encourage people to play with cross sections. What can they do for you? Look at how yellow warblers look on the Galapagos Islands. We have yellow warblers in the United States, but they don't have this orange crown. There are orange crowned yellow warblers out there. Um, here's uh, another little coastal scene. I'm just now just out playing with the birds. I'm walking to what's called Tortuga Bay. Um, and on my way, I find here are, here's, um, I, 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 get, I get out to Tortuga Bay. And I go on, I can rent a kayak and go by, by myself on a kayak. I mean, this is pretty good. Uh, you know, if you, if, if you are going to be someplace you can't travel, being on the Galapagos Islands is pretty ridiculously cool. So I hop on a little kayak and I uh, take myself out to where I can watch these blue-footed boobies. And it's, can I just tell you how much fun it is to sketch boobies and then get your blue paint? And come in there and draw in all of those um, those feet. I didn't draw the rest of the booby, but just I just had so much fun drawing those feet. And then mangroves, mangroves. Um, here is another side view diagram showing what red mangroves do, where they'll send these roots down, and then the roots will have roots, and it it, it and then it looks like there's a full tree on top of that. And black mangroves, this other species of mangrove, they send up these little snorkels. So black mangroves send up little snorkels to breathe through. Um, red mangroves send these cool little roots down. So red mangroves send things down. Black mangroves send little snorkels up. And this is a collection of... Um, from flower to developing seed pod of the mangrove pod. Zoom in on that. That was, that was a fun little study. And what I'm doing is we, we have uh, in the, uh, you see a number of nature journalers do this, where we'll, we'll find one plant and try to follow it in a place through a bunch of different phases. Um, it's a really useful tool. And so I just pulled out that, like, let's see how many stages of mangroves I can find. So I find this, and then it gets me looking for that, gets me looking for that, gets me looking for this. And then you finally find this thing. You're like, oh, boy, this is just so much fun. And uh, let's zoom out. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, the next day, that was the 25th, the next day, um, still can't travel but I can explore. I walk out to a little beach and this little duck wants to get sketched in the biggest way. Look what it does. So here's me, here's duck. Here's Darwin's finches sitting right next to me on the beach. This duck walks up and just lets me paint it in all of its duckiness. It's so much fun. I then um, go out to a little sailing pond. There are some plovers out there. And 
check out these diagrams, right? This is what they call the cracks or las grietas. And it's this giant volcanic fissure that if you look at it from the side, that is deeper than sea level. So this part is filled with seawater, and you can walk down here and jump in and swim, and there are all these fish in there. So here's an overview map of the crack. Here is a side view diagram. Here's me standing on the top going like, whoa, I want to go swimming down there. And here's this cool column that comes up in the middle of it. That was right over here. So here's a cross section through here. Here's that cross section view is right across this map here. And then this view here would be slicing it this way and kind of looking in at the relationship of sea level and the pond. And more like this one. Loved loved, loved looking at those, um, those orange crowned uh, <clears throat> um, yellow warblers. And the next day, I went up to the highlands and was able to see Tortoises at the Darwin Center, they were in enclosures as part of a captive breeding population. But when you get up to the highlands, they're just walking around and everybody makes their fences have this big gap in the bottom so that the tortoises can go under the fences. And so um, there's clearance for them to crawl under it. And they're just tortoises walking around being tortoises. And, and they're at, when you get up to the right elevation, they are all over the place, right? So these tortoise drawings are, so I'm using a ballpoint pen and then a two Tombow brush pens to give you the dark and this mid-tone gray. And that gave me, just allowed me to really quickly get these tortoise sketches. So um, also um, um, was writing about my, the, you know, my, my, my thoughts about them. Um, there met some naturalists up there who told me cool tortoise facts. Um, but this is kind of an interesting thought here. So there's a stillness here in the presence of these beings that have seen time. 200 years to live. You do not need to do it fast. And then I wrote, exhale deeply, because these things will often, they'll, they'll just be sit, they'll be completely silent, and then you'll hear one of these tortoises suddenly just give out this deep sigh. They'll just kind of go, <sighs> this wonderful deep tortoise sigh. Mm. Um, in a little nature center, they had a skeleton of one, so I drew a cross section um, showing how the skeleton fits on the inside. But, but look at, check this out. I mean, this is just looking out across a meadow here. This is, these are trees. And these are tortoises just sitting out here being tortoises, munching grass. You just nom, 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 nom. Munching grass, little cattle egrets walking around. I'd seen before cattle egrets by the, the feet of mammals in, in Africa. And here the cattle egrets were walking around next to these tortoises. Um, more, this is more using those two Tombow brush pens. So you see one for the subtle shadows. What I did is I first put in the mid-tone of gray. And then I just looked at where are the darkest darks and just punched in a few of those shadows. And those two tones, those two tones of pens allowed me to really, really quickly get um, these tortoise values onto these drawings. Oh, and then I went out and I found, uh, away from this, this tortoise preserve, um, 
there, there's a pair that were mating out in the middle of this field. So what happens is the males and females will mate at high elevation where I was. Then the females go down to lower elevation to lay their eggs. And then although they're having some problems with fire ants that have been introduced that are actually uh, destroying some of the, the, the groups of eggs, um, as well as rats and mice that humans have brought to the island. It is a real problem for these, these critters. Um, but the females go down elevation, lay their eggs, and then come back up to mate. And so these were a couple that were mating at, at high elevation. There's a little Darwin's finch on the back of a tortoise. And you look in the background, there's another tortoise, and there's another tortoise, and another tortoise. And, oh, they're just so big. Again, two tones of Tombow pen. So you, what you do is you just sort of look at where is the separation between light and dark on these things, and just wherever there's light, you don't put in that first light value Tombow pen, and then you look at it and say, where are my darkest darks? You punch in a few of those, and it really does a lot just to define those, those shapes. More mating tortoise. Um, I had all sorts of vivid dreams, and so this is, um, I had dreams about nature observation, and um, so this is waking up from, um, and my idea in my dream was, uh, there, there are two dream ideas that came from this sort of nature journaling dream. One is that you want to make thoughts, uh, room for the thoughts and the conversations that happen between ideas. That I was thinking that sort of ideas are supported by this sort of matrix of, sometimes it's not you know, like the big insights, but the, sometimes these, 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 these moments that sort of feel like downtime can support your, your thinking process. And the other idea on nature journaling that came from my, my dream states, um, where this idea that sometimes what you're doing is you are um, you want to de-summarize, to unsummarize. You want to expand. So you find some little observation and you want to not summarize it, but to expand it. And so what you can do is you find some little nugget of, uh, let's zoom in on this because I made a visual of this. This was me waking up in the morning going, I gotta write down this dream, right? So you've got these little, take a little nugget of, uh, of an observation and expand it. And, um, and then what you can do is from those, the, that expanded thing, you can pick some little part of that that you want to then expand on further. And that, um, or you can pick, you know, do something else, but, but you can just sort of keep following, like you, you take something and you expand and you go like, oh, that part's interesting and you expand that. And you go like, oh, that part's interesting and you expand that. And so you can, this is sort of my ideas of like how to fall down a rabbit hole. And um, a day later, um, I could travel again. And so I drove, here's a little diagram. Uh, a person, a friend who I had met drove me across the island and I sort of mapped the plant habitat zones as we went across. I'm now safe for travel. Again, so day 11 after your symptoms start, um, you are cleared for travel. And um, I, I hop on an airplane and I'm flying back to Quito and I can see these, um, uh, I, and, and, and in Quito, it is this unusually very clear day. There's a volcano by the edge of Quito and I look out there and here's in the evening light that volcano usually completely covered by clouds, and here it is um, with a little bit of gouache uh, to um, a volcano in the evening light. And th at this point, I rejoin the group who have been at an eco-lodge. And um, the next morning, we take off together to go look for Andean condors. And we go up to high elevations, 
and we get to this uh, the the, veg the the first through big forests and then through smaller and smaller and finally we get up above tree line, and we are we find ourselves on the edge of this little canyon and the vultures the, I mean the the condors roost on the edge of that canyon, and then they hop off and then they circle on thermals and they come up right in front of you. So these condors were passing back and forth right in front of us. And it was just so much fun to be with other human beings again. Um, and I just, I realized just how much I missed exploring with other nature journalers and, and friends. Um, but an absolute delight and um, hopped on an airplane the next day and we flew back to the United States and I didn't get COVID on the flight back. And um, that, let's see here, I'm going to change my cameras. And that, that was my experience on the Galapagos Islands. Um, there were some, hmm, there, there were just some really beautiful, beautiful moments. And I wonder about if, you know, having had that little kind of encounter with the virus, um, I wonder to what degree that was responsible for just when it came out after that, that time, everything just felt so bright and vivid and that feeling of, of gratitude just has been, is, has been, so, has been very accessible, very accessible since. Um, mm, that would, um, and so that was a little bit of my thought. So if anybody's got any questions or thoughts or comments or ideas, um, I, I would love to, 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 to chat with you about that. Um, and so you can just, uh, let's, let's join uh, Eleni. Um, hey there, it's great to see you and you can unmute. Thank you. It's just great to see you, Jack. And really, I just want to express my sincere gratitude for your sharing what I can only imagine was a very private and personal experience um, and sharing with us the really poignant lessons. Um, I'm just truly inspired by um, the journal you shared, both the, the drawings themselves and the variety of materials. I'm seeing more gouache. Um, I'm getting to know more, want to know more about more. Um, and really appreciated your willingness um, to share the other pieces that are more personal about feelings and showing what many of us know already is that uh, now shifting over to my journals, there they are this mixture of art and emotion. And I've tried over time to keep keep it separate, have one for the observational stuff and one for, and and I just decide decided fairly recently that that um, I should just do what I do. <laughs> you know, I have a journal for for wet. I have a, a dry, you know, pencils and markers and wet. And that's about as far as I can go because that that will be helpful in terms of the type of paper I use and the type of supplies I schlep along with myself. Um, anyway, I just want to express so much appreciation, which I'm so sure that others on this call um, share with me. And I'm glad to see you in good health. And um, thank, oh, thank you, you so much. <clears throat> you know, it, um, I, I also, you know, I, I remember when I was in 
in college, I was taking a class that required journaling. And the professor explained that there wasn't really room for, like, you know, as, as a scientist, you didn't put in your, you know, the, like, the, your, your, it was like, the facts, ma'am, just the facts, right? And um, that sort of made me think, like, there was a way that I was supposed to do it, and I was somehow supposed to be kind of this objective science brain kind of sponging around. And I, I, I found the same thing that, that you just described that, you know, when, when you're out there, um, both, all, all those elements are coming to play in your experience. And so give them permission and give them room to be there. And you will be, you'll get more out of all of those, those, uh, those, those experiences. And yeah, I, I, I like more kind of gave me, I wonder if more kind of from the, the, the get go, having more in there on my pages, just gave me permission to feel Right, and it's not something like I'd better put a morp in because uh, Amelia and Carolyn are going to want more morp, and so and that kind of gave me like you know just permission to 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 feel on that page, and then on that um, that day you know then that kind of spilled over into those big feeling boxes, or just getting philosophical when like instead of instead of being a scientist out there with the the tortoises i was i was i was philosophizing and and thinking about time and the breath of the tortoise and it really took me in a different direction and i guess you know there there's no right way to do nature journaling but this is, it was really interesting for me to see like yeah there's yeah give yourself room and permission to let this be part of what you do Oh, 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 sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. The... That was that was my mistake. Um, it, it also speaks to the the nature of it uh, uh, of the journal as a thing. So those of us who came to nature journaling through fine art, <laughs> that's a funny word, but you know, through art, <laughs> the journal is a private, um, personal. Uh, phenomena and you know you use the journal to do drafts and then you transfer the you know something you you know into a canvas or something else and so it it is kind of wonderful to remind ourselves of, of uh, about the feature of a journal that that lends itself to intimacy because it closes mm -hmm. it closes it opens you can share your journal with, you know, the spread open. Um, and I, I continue, I'm looking over at the journals. I got the dry, the wet, the, you know, and it, 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 and the dry and wet is the only distinction I could make. And then along with size, um, but they're all personal, they're all intimate because even, even when I have just drawn a bird or just drawn a stick, I've been drawing a stick a day, they're so emotional that drawing that stick has helped me focus. And while I focused on drawing that stick, I figured out this thing that was bothering me or I reflected on this other thing, but not in a forceful like oh what am i going to do about that but by the time that stick is done i'm ready for the day so mm -hmm. i i'm sure that that some of what i'm saying resonates with you and others so um i just really just so appreciate this space Lenny, thank you so much for for sharing thank you that. I mean, your, your thoughts about, uh, you, uh, Ve was also commenting on that, like, you know, you're describing how the journal opens and closes. Yeah. The, um, and that gives you perhaps, um, you know, the, 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 the safety to be more, more personal, more intimate. That's right. Um, and 
you can choose later to share that with someone or not. That's right. Um, and that, but, but, but also by doing that work, it gives us permission to both pay attention to the feelings or to the stick. Um, and when you pay attention to the stick, you're also calming all those other voices yeah. in your head and you give your brain room. The polyvagal part back here, mm. giving it a chance to calm down. Yeah. And, and, and what comes, what comes from that? That's, that's powerful. That's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. And that's also one of the benefits of nature journaling. I'm designing this class for the fall to teach here locally. It's unbelievable that no one teaches nature journaling. So I'm going to be the first one here in Princeton, West Windsor. And oh. uh, uh, about being present, I think yeah. uh, being totally, totally present um, is, uh, is the biggest gift at all. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So uh, being being present in the world, being present in your life. Um, and yeah. in all those feelings, I mean, to, yeah. to, to be in a room, in a boat, and hope that the window is facing something that you can look at and draw. That's just very poignant to hear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear others. Let's go to other Great. Uh, I really appreciate you 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 sharing that. Um, let's we're going to join um, Ivea, Sarah, and then Kate. Um, Ivea, hey there. Hey there. Um, just <clears throat> to, I just you said for any comments or questions on your on your trip and this oh, is going to sound also, like I wanted to 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 uh, go spelunking in your journals. I would be delighted. <laughs> That's, I was really looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say this, I don't know if this is gonna come across as weird, but just from one human being to another, I'm incredibly proud of you. You, in what was probably one of the scariest moments of your life, you thought about the people around you. Um, you already do because like taking the test before you went on the plane in the first place to make sure that whatever community you were going to would be safe and that you immediately sequestered yourself in your cabin when you got that positive COVID test, when it would have been easy and understandable to go and look, you know, to share that fear with somebody and to look for that comfort that you wouldn't be alone, that you immediately put everybody else's well-beings first. And I have. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, second guessing myself, you know, about you know, what, um, you know, as that cough was in increasing, like, what if I had, what, what if I had, had acted sooner? And fortunately, no one on the trip got sick. No one on our, uh, no, no one caught it from me. But, you know, I, I, I have been doing lots of, you know, second guessing about like, you know, there was a period there where I was doing dry coughs. I had a clear symptom of, of COVID, but, but I also had all of the, it's, it's, it's interesting to have the, um, hear all the reasons to, um, to, kind of deny, like, like there, there, there's plausible deniability, like my test wasn't positive yet, right? Um, but, I, but I did have symptoms. I, I, was, I was, you know, developing this dry cough. Um, I, I, I do wonder for myself, like, you know, could I have gotten my, you know, what would I need to do to be in a mental state where I could pick up on that and recognize it for what it was at an earlier stage? Because I, I know that my brain did not want that to be COVID, and I was, you know, you know, if there, there's, there's a, 
um, you know, there's there's plausible deniability. Right? Um, you know, as as much as I study, you know, uh, biases and all those sorts of things, you know, here is, I mean, what an uh, an example of motivated reasoning, right? <laughs> you know, I, I I really don't want this to be COVID on day two of this trip. No, I don't. I hear but that. Who would, who would want it to be COVID on day two of the trip? Yeah. Nobody, absolutely nobody. Um, and though the, but it sounds like in spite of that, you did, you, you took the test anyways. You yeah. dealt with that plausible, that plausible de deniability. And that's still hard to do, but you kept doing it. Yeah. I think you did as well, if not better than anybody could expect in that situation. At least that's my opinion. And I know that you probably have the self-doubts because that's what we do as people, yeah. especially very compassionate people who worry about other people. Yeah. And I, I keep sort of, you know, re reviewing those like, you know, what if, um, you know, what is the, And what, what, what I do hope is that going, if I'm in a similar situation in the future, it will make me even better able to recognize it and move on it. I like that. I, I, I like that idea too. We, when we know better, I, I think it was my Angelo who said that when we know better, we do better. You did the Ooh. best you could with what you had. Yeah. I think that's true. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to say how much I admire you for that. Oh, thank and you. that I thought it was awesome that even while you weren't feeling good, you're still like, I want to journal. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, on, on my on my dizzy day, like I, I I could I could make a little icon of myself. Yeah, that, that was that was that was hard. That that's hard, but also like that perseverance that you show that's life goals for people like me i admire that <laughs> oh, and you. and and the grace that you had in how in like looking at all just i just i so admire you i'm not articulating this very well but i just really oh, oh thank you really admire you yeah. and i'm glad that you're okay i'm so I, glad you're I, okay no, I, I i i'm incredibly lucky i'm i'm i'm, I'm lucky um i am somebody who was able to get the vaccine. I was able to get triple boosted. Um, I'm lucky. Um, I had, you know, on speed dial, Sabelle, who's an infectious disease COVID expert. <laughs> so I, I, I had, I, I could pick up the red phone and, 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 and WhatsApp with a, uh, you know, a, a, uh, an infectious disease expert. Um, I didn't have symptoms that were life-threatening. I was really, really lucky. I had a mild case. And um, the, um, and people around me were being really thoughtful and, and taking care of me. You know, there'd, there'd be this little knock at the door and, you know, there'd be, little pile of food and um, yeah, people, people took care of me and I've got just, so, yeah, so much to be grateful for. And other people were not that lucky. A lot of other people were not that lucky. Um, yeah. And as usual, you know, I say this like practically every time I think of her. Thank you again to Sabelle for being a hero in this and for helping us find that cure. Yeah. And for helping us find what it means to be safe in all of this. I'm really, really proud of the way she showed up for the world in this pandemic. Me too. So what's been going on with your journals? So, um, so I struggled a bit at certain times during the summer, but overall had a pretty good time. Um, so I, I started making these charts um, 
as the result of something. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll share that in a little bit about exactly why I began making color charts in the beginning. But first, I'd gone out to this field trip um, to the Academy of Sciences with some friends. Um, and so at first, we were talking about bugs and how they're stacked on each other. And so that was kind of fun um, talking about bug diagrams. And, and then um, went on a little bit to, I, I was just trying to sketch note what we were talking about, because for me, sketch noting is something I find challenging. Um, so I was trying to sketch note our discussion. Then we actually got into the exhibit, which happens to be called Hidden Wonders. And you know, the name wonder immediately makes me go, oh, <laughs> nature journaling. Um, and so trying to draw the different things that I saw looking at this pelican um, and thinking about different techniques and capturing things, especially if I'm standing up drawing, which is challenging. Um, saw in their exhibit some of the Darwin's finches. And of course that gave me, um, it made my skin tingle all over because I'm looking at these finches. They're not alive, which is difficult always for me to see in a specimen. But then I'm hoping that you and Marley were seeing alive ones. And it sounds like you did, which makes me really, really happy. Um, and then looking at the huge beak and being like, wow, that is a big beak. Um, <laughs> um, and then I got to pay a little homage to a critter who I deeply respect, the Xerxes butterfly. I've never seen a specimen before. Um, for those who don't know, Xerxes is a now extinct blue butterfly that used to live here in San Francisco until the 1940s. And urban development destroyed their habitat. And also they were unable to find their um, their host species, one of which is the deerweed, which luckily is still alive and one of the ones in my site. So Xerxes has been sort of, I guess you could say an inspiration I've been chasing for years. Um, and so to see an actual specimen for the first time in my life just made me very emotional. So I sat there for quite a while obsessively trying to get the dots and then I wrote some things. Um, and I'll read actually what I wrote. I wrote, for the first time in my life, I am laying my eyes upon a species I have long loved, but never known. Um, and, then, and then I wrote down about the different showy, unique patterns and everything. And then I wrote, these outstretched wings unnaturally pinned are the only position I will ever see a Xerxes wing in, the death position. Oh. Because I think about the way that, that um, <laughs> you told us about how if you see the butterflies like this, it means it's dead because butterflies don't naturally sit like that. So it just really, that came back to me when I was looking at the Xerxes and thinking I'll never see it in any other position to draw it. And I wrote wow. down, I pay my respects to you Xerxes. In your absence, I promise to do my best to watch out for the, utter butter, for the other butterflies and moths who inhabit your playground. Wow. So uh -huh. very- What can we do for the living to respect the dead? Exactly. And that's because there is a relative that we're reintroducing soon, hopefully, the silvery blue, who might have the same ecosystem function as mm -hmm. Xerxes, and a rescuing another relative called the mission blue butterfly who is endangered and who still lives in these parts. So that's what I was thinking of. Then we walked by. I tried to draw a skeleton while we were walking by. <laughs> <laughs> you need more work on drawing skeletons while walking. I don't know. Trying to watch this one stellar jay who was hopping all around the ground during lunchtime and thinking, how am I going to do movement lines? Challenging. Then began um, going to the African Hall of, of Science, which naturally made me think of you. And so writing down about the differences in animal walkings, um, plantigrade versus, which is like all on the entire sole of the foot, I guess. Is that right? Digitigrade, which is sort of on the toesies, and then unguligrade, which is on the nails. Um, yeah. Because, because as Marley taught me, uñas in Spanish is fingernails. So then, you know, looking at their, their kneecaps, the way that their whole diagramming system works, um, writing down as many of the Swahili names as I could, counting that there were 13 different types of ungulates in the African hall, trying to draw their special With legs. Dot box diagram. Mm -hmm. Super duper fun. Um, learning a bit about about the different hooves and then noticing that zebras and horse hooves remind me a lot of each other because it's only one toe. And that was fun yeah. to actually look at that and make my own connection and be like, ah, aha. And so then that was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got to see my love, Octoboss. Notice that there was something here and I'm hoping that she's not injured because it was this white patch on her otherwise very deep reddish um, orange skin. I don't know what that is. Then she was meanwhile very active and being very dramatic. So she had her her eyes sort of beneath the um beneath the thing like the um 
the viewing <laughs> area. And then she kind of like very dramatically raise up an arm and trail it down her tank. So that's her being dramatic. I just, I love Octoboss. And then we were drawing <laughs> the tunnel with their huge lips that I love. Oh. Uh, and then trying to, and then the funny thing is we kept hearing people saying, is that alive? Is that alive? Is that real? And then yes, then the fish would move and yes, it's alive and real. So then drawing fish, learning about the placement of the different kinds of fins. Oh, that's fun. Um, fun, fun. Isn't it a blast to be doing this with a crew? Yes, it is. I loved it. And, and, and we stayed masked the entire time. So that was awesome. Yeah. At lunchtime, we sat outside facing slightly away from each other as we ate. So that was good. And then this was me getting back into the field, finally doing field, like field journaling after a bit of a crisis of not um, emotional stuff I'll get into in a sec. And so I started out with using Roseanne Hansen's ruler of metadata, um, did a little sketch of the landscape I was staring at, which is by the bike path, and then wrote an entire page of metadata down and full with questions. I was like, thank wow, you, Roseanne. That's metadata like a boss. What was um, one of the more um, interesting observations that by doing this sort of deep metadata um, that you picked up on? Let's see here. Um, noticing that, that, like really affirming that the wind really does move from west to east in there and then wondering if that's going to affect the shapes of the trees. Um, wondering about the drought there and wondering if that, like the curiosity then to then go down and check the weeping walls. I didn't get to check the weeping walls, but thinking about that one. Um, oh yes, something um, that Rebecca has been teaching us in restoration. I wrote down this question, in our ecosystem here, who are our larders and who are our lacks? So that's a question I'll be exploring a bunch. Uh, um, unpack that for me, um, larders and lacks. Absolutely. So larders are, where are the resources that are kind of stockpiled in the community or where is it that we have a lot of resources of a kind of thing? So like, for example, think of jays burying their nuts in a bunch of different places, their acorns. And so then you might have storage of that um, or maybe or maybe the, um, the woodpeckers that do that in the tree, maybe that's a larder because then it's a it's a resource for the entire community. But maybe we're in a drought, so the lack is water. Um, yeah, well, or maybe in a larder we have you know a lot of good materials that make soil, like you know a lot of duff in there. And so so it's just the question of where are do we have enough resources and where do we not? Yeah, I was just looking this morning at um, I was walking around and there were very few. I wasn't finding a lot of birds, and then came across and a blue elderberry bush. And all the birds in the neighborhood were there. And uh, uh, it, it just went from like, why, you know, there, you really can't find any, any, any birds around here to like, oh, they're all in the blue elderberry. Nice. Very nice. I love that. And I love that you were paying attention to where did they go? And then you find out the bird ha hangout spot. And when you see that, like when you ask that question and you find that answer, it sticks to you. Oh, I'm going to keep an eye on that blue elderberry yeah. from now on to see. Exactly. Exactly. And so then um, writing down who, um, instead of trying to draw everyone, I just wrote them down because it was faster for me. And at that point I realized I'd been out there for an hour um, doing this stuff. And so I wrote down who's flowering today and then who is fruiting today. Huge list in here um, um, about that. And then because I've been wondering, I decided to count which ones were native, which ones were introduced and which ones I didn't know about. And so then I counted how many of each because I've got this long-term question about pollinators. Um, and about whether if we remove the species we're supposed to, will the pollinators have enough and then what the implications will be yeah. during the different seasons. So keeping notes of that, writing down the names to remind myself that later I want to try sketching all of these again and again until it gets easy, then noticing a gigantic wasp nest that day close yeah. by to where some things were um, for some other um, um, ground wasp nests where so I was like, oh my God, holy monkeys. And so I, I drew that, I had to draw that. You know, So, so that, that, that wasn't a ground wasp. Yes, oh, no, was... no, no. This was this was up in a eucalyptus tree. Wow. <laughs> I've never seen one of those in the wild before. I was like, oh my God. Wow. Just like <laughs> like in, in picture books. Yeah, or in um exhibits in the museum, maybe. Yeah. Um, without being inhabited. And there were two holes, and I noticed that. And then I heard mm -hmm. things about how possibly sometimes some will enter through the bar. I, yeah, I've got some more research I gotta do about how exactly they're structured inside and where the queen lives and the larva and who lives at the bottom, who lives at the top. And then on top of that, um I was actually really proud of my supervisor. My supervisor gave me information that he later thought might have been false. And I was proud of him for like thinking about that. And he was apologist. I'm like, no, 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 this is all learning. So I just gave him the nature journaling attitude of it's okay to make mistakes. But he'd said that um, that 
they thought that they that there were birds who were nesting in um, the poison hemlock. And since I take out poison hemlock, I had questions. And so I made myself a little Y web, except I did it like an umbel. It was fun. Um, and so my question is, how will me taking out this poison hemlock affect the birds? Um, and then a later on to-dos list, because I like to-dos, um, especially that I need to go back and do a trash walk. And that was that was the start of this journal, because this was going to be my um, field trip journal. And this was supposed to be my practice journal. And I'm going to go through this really fast, because I know there's other folks who are wanting to share. Um, but at my site, as you gather, I'm trying to learn as much as I can about it. I've got to go back and do my biometrics, um, trying to make a, um, a, a list of my table of contents because the index is weird um, when things are falling apart, cats, stuff that we did just before you left. And so I have this project where I'm trying to learn the birds at my sites because folks know from my name here that I'm more of a botanist than a birder, and I really am beginning to love birds. So I've been using Merlin Bird ID to hear the sounds of the birds. And so then I write down um, all of the names that came up from Merlin Bird ID. I went back through. Some of them I'm still questioning. Like, I don't think that this one really lives around here. So I'm curious to know if that actually mm -hmm. showed up. I kind of doubt it. Mm -hmm. And so these are the ones I've gotten so far, including some that I didn't hear, but I saw. Um, so I wrote those down too, with those kinds of signs. And so I thought it'd be fun to deep dive into them because I want to make sure that I'm really taking care of all of the birds at my site. So I started with this, y'all saw some of this, um, trying very hard to sketch um, hummingbirds and then succeeding, but after a lot of practice. So that's our Allens, which my son likes to call yeah. a bird. Um, let's see here, more bug nights with predaceous diving beetles and Trisha. Um, she teaches us so much, so that is always a blast. A little bit of Arctostophilus with Brian Higginbotham, which is helpful to me um, because that teaches me about a plant that I happen to care a lot about. Some of the uses. Um, let's see here, plant families and our foods preparations. Um, and then occasional like blind contours that I do um, when these are on the screen. Um, sometimes more than once because I teach the class more than once. Um, Kate's bird safari, which was a blast. And in that one, because okay. we're going by really fast, then I learned to draw really fast and to try to take color notes and shadowing notes. And this is something I need to improve on. I thought it'd be fun to go back with a couple of these and attempt to use my own color notes to see if I could color them incorrectly. I'm not sure if I'll be able to, but I thought it'd be fun to try. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of an example. So those are uh, great color notes. That, the idea of keeping those little color notes makes a huge, huge difference. Because then you can get color information in and, 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 and localized without having to change your, your drawing tools. It's so nice for, for being fast in the field. And so my idea with going back to draw these is to see if my system works. Um, because then that's why I began to do the color swatches at the beginning of my journal is because I thought that maybe if I could abbreviate some of those very specific colors. Oh, that good idea. Help. So then boop the snoot, um, because we were talking about that, a term that Susan and Kate introduced me to. Um, solar prep with Susan, including this amazing diagram that she gave us that introduced to us how exactly tangent works. It was wonderful. Um, so I drew that and then we made our estimates a few days before the solstice about where things would be and I was right in my estimates so it made me feel like I actually could use math effectively it was very affirming warblers I have to go back and add data to these wow yeah it was it was just um a little while ago that you were saying I can't do birds and you it was scary for you it was really uncomfortable and you pushed yourself into that space and made yourself sort of stand there with those birds and that this has just opened up for you my goodness i mean you've just you have this is a major breakthrough for you in your 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 birdness Thank you. wow um i appreciate that because i'm i found it be, to be really therapeutic beginning to draw these. These are different from field sketches. And so I treat them as being different. Yeah. It's information gathering, but it's also become therapy. See, a the thing is, I also, so folks know I suffer from depression. And so I do a thing now where I create what my doctor calls a ta-da list, where if I get stuff done, I write it down sometimes um, mm -hmm. because then I feel slightly better. 
And yeah. then I can look back and say like, I, when my self-doubts begin kicking me and saying, you didn't do anything this week. Or when people in real life tell me you didn't do anything this week, I can say, oh, but I did. And yes, so, you did. And so this was during editing. Oh, look at this like, connect. And I, I love the way you're also, your, your understanding of how to get colors to, 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 to blend into each other. The, the chest of that little toucanet is uh, just, it's it very, very sensitive and spot on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like it's little toucanet toes too. And um, I was lucky um, that I got this book. This book was giving me challenges because it smears and it challenged me to paint everything because then that means that it can't smear if I give it watercoloring as a fix it <laughs> My son making cookies. Um, Steel Blue Cricket Hunters, I wanted to go back and add more notes, but I was just sitting there gawking at the inflorescence. So I went back and did a bit more detail. Because oh, wait, 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 wait. You owned this iridescent space here. Thank you. It's because it's pretty. Look iridescence it. like a boss. Um, and, and, and so there, there are people who are watching this and they're saying to themselves, um, well, that's sure you can do that because you're an artist. Um, but what folks, uh, who are, are new to meeting Avea might not know is that this is an, an area where she, you, you didn't feel this was way, way, way outside of your comfort zone. And you made yourself extremely vulnerable and stepped into this space and Ray Bonto style put in a ton of pencil miles and it it is really really we, we can see the effect of that 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 here this is amazing this you you you're really understanding shape and structure as well as how all these different media work how how to get the watercolor to cooperate thank you thank you very much for that and um, and then also like you, I also sometimes keep track of my feelings. Um, mm. And so I decided instead of just simply thinking about depression, occasionally writing it down. Yeah. Um, I don't mind sharing this because I think a lot of people can relate who have depression. So um, I question why am I so depressed today? Because we don't always know why. And then um, my other side asks, did I hide it well enough? Because oh. we feel like we can't oh. talk about our depression. That's right. So <clears throat> I decided to be yep. okay to to write right. and, and I mean, that that is that is so poignant because you're 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 absolutely right we um with if if somebody has covid we say oh how awful that you got this disease if somebody has depression then we see it as a moral failing mm -hmm and and blame the person oh and there's there's the rainbow uh, one more bird left to go and i know that this one is missing their nostrils um, <laughs> this was an honor of pride i thought this thought just came into my head that i wanted to honor bird, the pride and the birds like this oh. and so i did it for funsies and it was fun um, it, it was especially fun trying to figure out how to get some of the birds who are blending in with their backgrounds to stand out just a little bit and play with the subtleties. Mm -hmm. So I've got more work to do. I have to finish off the violet saber wing. Um, but sometimes giving yourself a project helps. Sorry, I'll try to go a bit faster. <laughs> um, colors, Pencil Miles Friends, finally finished drawing Sarah. So that makes me happy. Yay, Pencil Miles Friends. We were drawing each other that day. Um, Let's see here, more things. Um, a beginning, I have to finish this. It's about how to take care of my, um, my what you call it, um, Venus flytrap, that's the one. Spiders, Trisha unfortunately says that she doesn't really know spiders, but she actually went and did something that was outside of her comfort zone and uh, taught spiders. And awesome. I was overjoyed. I want to know more spiders. So when, if and when you want to explore spider vocab, I am totally wanting to be in your boat and learn and everything. So, <laughs> okay, sketching I will do. Pictures. Oh, fuzzy fox! Sketching in a park. Um, oh yeah, yeah, the fox. Um, 
my friend, my, my former Aikido teacher, actually, I guess you could say that once an Aikido teacher always. So my Aikido sensei took a picture of this box. And so I was like, I want to draw you. You're foofy and cute. Aww. And then drawing from the calendar because it made me think of you and trying to do um, block landscapes. And eventually I'm going to finish drawing this of my backyard and kitty cat. Uh, let me see. Sorry. <laughs> I really am taking way too long. Okay. No, no, uh, this, this is, uh, I, I, I had, I am so inspired at just you, you just dove all the way in and, um, and also a number of people have commented and I absolutely agree just that your, your willingness to, to also, you know, put your own heart onto the page. Thank you. Um, oh, look at that jumping spider. That's Isn't it cute? Cool. It is so, don't you just want to pinch those little cheeks? They're those so cute. I love, I love jumping spiders and then more birds. I love oh, jumping yeah. spiders. They're just like, they're, it's just, they're but a pet that you want to, you just want to draw them. You want everything to do with them. A restoration class with Rebecca, trying to draw how things relate to each other in my environment, which happens mm. to be a concrete backyard that I like to call the Garden of Eton because I'm, yeah. And ridiculous like that. Um, looking at heritage species from all my different backgrounds because I'm from a super duper mixed background and I don't know where I had to keep track of all my different heritages. Um, let's see here, Lady ACA. <laughs> Trying again to draw faces. Um, another thing I liked about doing the, um, the Tada list in the journals is that then I didn't feel quite as guilty if I couldn't finish up an entire page of work. I could just sketch however much I had time and energy for. Drawing with with um, herps with Kate and Parker, that was super fun. During Kate's live stream, going back to draw more birds as I was editing videos. Um, and thank you so much for editing all those videos for us. My pleasure. Trying to draw birds smaller in the fields so that I get a better idea of how to do it. Um, again, editing and then oh. and then the occasional mouse that I get to draw. It's kind of fun. Um, you have just been busting your pencil miles. This is amazing thank you i mean check you out you're owning the watercolor and bird proportions those blues mixing into each other you're and it feels like it's fun yes it, it's turned the corner from being threatening to fun and you're right about palm trees being difficult really difficult i want to try again. funky Yes, yes, they are. I was watching, I was noticing how you did it. And I'm like, that's what I had to do. I had to start from the top fronds. Like you're always teaching with the other trees. So next time I'll just start from the top fronds because it felt like these weren't floofy enough. So yeah. if I start from there, then it will be floofy enough. With fronds like those, who needs enemies? <laughs> oh, you make me so happy. <laughs> also, yeah. everybody should go check out Nature Journaling Self-Care with Kate Ryder. She teaches good things. Um, I put it up on the YouTube. It's great. Oh, yeah, and then I was even asking that question of myself, why am I feeling anxious about drawing birds? But instead of like actually going and trying to write that down, I just started drawing more birds because that's how I go. <laughs> birds, birds, and birds, and oh. also birds. Not that that's not a bird. That's a lie. That yeah. is a bird. <laughs> not a bird. But these are these birds. They're not finished yet. This one's not finished because it was so much fun. Um, these aren't finished, but some of them are just finished. Mohawks. Yay, Mohawks. Oh, um, no with birds <clears throat> and the really pretty place that I happen to visit field notes these are all field notes so my field notes as you see look extremely different from my actual like in studio notes and that's okay yes I can yes. make that decision um and yeah, okay so uh, this is so exciting in the field um trying and, to and it, the, the the stuff you do in the studio also rolls over then into your uh, in, in, in the, the in the studio rolls over into the field as you you know are just you know assembling these shapes and and oh wonderful thank you um, not done i just did the paint to make it so it wouldn't smear <laughs> trying to draw side view landscapes like you're oh yeah aren't those fun they really are and then trying to put down larders and lacks to remind myself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Woodpeckers just began starting that last night. Um, Starling, I didn't color oh. it because I just like the iridescence, and then I'm going to color it in and try to figure out how to make the iridescence pop. Yep. Yeah. If, if I don't do it right this time, I'll just do it again later. Um, uh, wait, wait, check out your growth mindset. Ah, oh, 
So exciting. Your workshop. And then thinking about you in Kenya. Uh, roll, Herbert. <laughs> Try to be finished. Scorpions, taking the Myers-Briggs test, realizing what I was, and then deciding to think about how I felt about that whole thing. It's like, oh, geez. Yay, the fun of being an INFJ. Um, this one from your lesson with Gael. Um, that was so much fun. It really was. Bugs last Thursday. Um, giant water beetles. This was on the field. This is this is me sitting down after pulling out a bunch of um, radishes with my hands and every part of my body trembling and sweating and managing to put this and this together in five minutes, just sitting there during break, just sketching mm -hmm. and not worrying anymore. And then afterwards sitting there for like half an hour trying to do this little thing right here um, and get all of the craziness happening in the field. So that was fun. And um, I think that's almost it. Um, yeah, melons with Brian. We had a very good time indeed. A um, very good time. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I accidentally showed up on a Sunday, so that was fun. I got to go back and color it in some more. Um, me sitting outside of the coffee shop trying to dry, I was leaving more room for the pigeons and thinking of Ray Bonto because there's also a display in there about pigeons. Um, and then suddenly got distracted by a dog. So I was like, oh, it's a dog. A, a dog. Um, Check out your anatomy. <laughs> And then I was watching your thing about the Academy of Sciences. Now I have questions. And, um, and then um, a little preview of what's tomorrow for everybody. Oh. And then just great. now when you were showing us the Galapagos. So oh. Oh, that it, is it for now. So, so <laughs> for the, what, what you know? I really am, um, there's, there's, there's so much to unpack here. Um, one is, just your bravery in opening yourself up, just being vulnerable to all sorts of, of, of new things and challenges and the way that you're, you're diving in and, and addressing those. And also your incredible honesty and vulnerability with also putting in those, those personal, social, emotional things into your journal and then for ha having the courage to share that with us other people would like i'm gonna put a paper clip on that page that's one that i just sort of flipped by that's not for you guys but you you when you showed that to us there's a bunch of people who are like here saying like yes yes me too like i suffer from depression but i hide it right and and not just saying that i do this but also saying yeah and i hide it and and i mean that is so insightful and powerful and real. And I really, I really celebrate that and honor that. Um, I this want people to is, know alone. And your commitment to those pencil miles, isn't it amazing to see what happens when you and your fingers show up? Yeah, it's, wow. I feel calmer, I feel, more peaceful. It, it's become my ritual that I like to do after a stressful day, during a stressful day even. It's relaxing and even though I don't always have a lot of time to do them, I can still get into flow a little bit faster each time. I thought for the longest time that I needed a significant period of time to get into flow and I thought that I couldn't do it and that I'd always be at that disadvantage, but I realized that you can get into flow pretty fast if you yes. keep doing it. I'm yep. really thankful for that. I didn't realize that before. Mm. So mm. thank you. <laughs> thank you for letting me share. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, the, and so, so hey, take, take home for everybody watching this that the world opens up to us if we're willing to take off part of our armor. Um, cause that, that, that armor, it prevents us from, from taking a risk. It prevents us from being in the place of a novice. It prevents us from connecting with other people that, you know, <clears throat> if I stay over here, you know, in this, um, actually I'm going to change my metaphor. Um, it's now an exoskeleton, right? If you're going to grow, you need to shed your skin. 
and that means that you're going to be a soft shell for a while and that's scary mm -hmm. it's scary to be out there and to be soft shell but every time you want to grow it is going to take vulnerability yeah. and you really demonstrated that here um, mm. i am so proud of you thank you so much jack it means everything to me thank you Avea. thank you mm. Mm. that's absolutely beautiful um let's see um let's join sarah and you can unmute. And Sarah, I'm gonna bring you in. Um, welcome to the conversation. Hi, welcome back. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things to say and a couple of things to share. So um, first I wanna say, going back to you, Jack, and explaining all of your um, trials and tribulations of COVID is I think my takeaway is forgive yourself. We worry, we, um, feel guilty. We wonder what we could have done better. But I think right now is a good time for you to forgive yourself. And it's not your fault. I mean, that that bug is out there. And it's kind of inevitable that each of us gets it as careful as we're all being. And while you were describing all that, I tested negative. Oh. So I ran in and got my test because I was at I regretfully was at what I think could have been a super spreader event this weekend. Mm. And I really regret it. I've been kicking myself. I've been super, super careful for three years, however long it's been um, for myself and for my spouse and for all of my friends. And, and I'm telling myself, I just, I just have to, I have to get past that guilt and stuff and just communicate with my friends and say, okay, here's what happened last weekend. I'm testing myself. I'm being really careful. If you don't choose not to be around me, that's fine. If we choose to change our schedules around this, that's fine. And I'll let you know. Um, so, so I just want to say, forgive yourself. And, um, and that all of your what ifs, what if I infected somebody else? What if the girls get sick? What if, you know, my Girl Scout leader way back when I was like eight years old said, what if is like a little monster. It's like that little green monster on your shoulder and we can't live with all the what ifs. Let's get past that and say, what if the next time I do something like that, I can practice something mm. different. So give yourself permission for that. Um, so, and then I also wanna say to Avea, you are positively glowing with everything that you've done and with sharing what you shared with us. You are glowing. I can see even in your face, the difference that all of this has made for you from inside out. And I just wanna say, you both are making me get like emotional and choked up over your sharing. So thank you, Avea. That was huge and thank you. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just um, so um, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit of um, diving into what I've been doing just really super briefly, because I've been so inspired, Jack, by what your lessons have been and what I've done and grown through over the last almost two years and following um, the videos and the live things like this. And I can really see how my brain has just kept growing. I'm surprised it still fits in here because it just keeps growing and I keep geeking out. And, and the rabbit ears, I don't know why they're hiding today, but I keep teasing my husband that he's got to pull those ears out of the hole because there I go diving down it again. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so we had talked quite a long time ago, you and I, about visiting this space um, and maybe even bringing the girls that I wanted to share with you called Calabasas Creek up here in Sonoma County. Sometime we've still got to do that. But I did a park preview day as a volunteer two Sundays ago where I'm a trail patrol volunteer. I'm there assisting the visitors and I'm walking along and I meet up with a staff person who's just geeking out over something on a leaf. And I'm like, what is it? What is it? What is it you see, Michelle? And she's like, look at this caterpillar. Well, oh my God, I had to 
I had to journal this caterpillar. Let's see, let's get this back out. So I saw, I know these plants, Napa false indigo. I saw the caterpillar. I journaled the caterpillar. I took pictures of the caterpillar because look at that face. Oh my God. That is so cool. And then I was wondering, does it have that kind of head? Because if a bird comes along and plucks at it, is that head going to come off? Well, as a matter of fact, I found out it doesn't, but I didn't want to just give up what it is. So I made a little, you have to lift this flap to find out what it is oh. from my photo. <laughs> so that, this was really fun. And there was another one that was wrapped up in some trail flagging, which is what first caught her attention. So there's this trail flagging to mark the indigo to keep it from getting weed whacked. And there was one of these caterpillars that had wrapped itself up in the end of the trail flagging and was starting to cocoon. So this was just like one of those, oh my God, look at that weird critter. And I wow. really had fun simply just quick sketching it really. Yeah. And thinking of how you encourage us to do that. Um, so before that, I was up in Truckee. We went for a week vacation. I had to break out a brand new journal <laughs> with me because I have so much work I want to do. And one of the things that I gave myself permission to do was a variety of techniques and styles. So I started with the first day, it was a lot of flowers. So I just did kind of some just general flowers. And I was looking at your Sierra guide a lot. I love that guide. And I'm telling you the wildflowers were on steroids up there. Oh, and trying um... to get rocks and granite and hillsides is really hard. So mm -hmm. I just sat on the trail and did this and watercolored it right there just to kind of get a general idea of what it looked like. This is at your valley above Truckee. And lots of this penstemon blooming. I just sketched that. I had pre-washed some of the pages. Oh, isn't that fun? A recent, a recent thing that you did. Um, we came across some bear tracks, so I mm. haven't put any color on this, but I had to sh do the shape and then how it scrapes its foot with each step. And I measured the areas. That was really fun. That is really cool. I love the, oh, that is really, that's great tracking. And then, um, and then this one, this flower, how can you not just oh, think that's so fun because I got the elephant shaped heads. Yes. And that makes, that so I, it, yeah, just totally little elephant faces. Yeah. Little pink elephants. Yeah. There were some, the first ones I saw were like, um, lavender purpley. And then when we got up to about 9,000 feet, there were pink ones. Wow. So that was really, oh, really that cool. is so much fun. That was just and, fun and to I just wonder like, how does the pollination mechanism work on those things? I had to investigate that too. Um, it has to do with buzz pollination. <gasps> oh yeah. Yeah, I had to take that deep dive too. Um, so then um, another day, I had to map out the beaver ponds. So oh. this is at a restored alpine meadow. Remember those workshops we did? I yeah. mapped the beaver ponds. This is at Parazzo Meadows, um, and this is by... Truckee Donner Land Trust has restored this whole meadow system. And we saw it right after they had first done the work on it several years ago. And this is what it looks like right now. It just was so cool to map out the beaver ponds. And this was in one very short, maybe half mile segment of the Little Truckee River. And oh, this is so beaver. cool. But so that what, was just what a great action. exercise. Um, and I love that the, little key you have to all of the beaver evidence and the, the different. Uh, yeah, the, the lodge, um, a lodge with grass growing on it, um, the willows, because I just wanted to do general shapes. I didn't want to have to get into detail. I am yeah. a detail person. So trying to do a little map like that was really super fun. And then I also gave myself permission to go to the back of my journal and use the toned pages. So I did this one out on trail one day. I took myself and plopped myself down next to the trail and drew this bog orchid. And it was 
fun because I was playing with gouache and watercolor yes. to get yes. it on its own paper. And I'm certain that one of the mountain bike riders that came by me was like, well, I did hear him exclaim because he doesn't, he's not used to seeing somebody sitting on the edge of a trail and painting. And he was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. And I said, it's okay. I'm just <laughs> here having fun. Um, the one that I did this week that I'm really proud of because last week I was missing you and I um, and the these sessions. And so I watched, oh my gosh. And <laughs> gouache has been really intimidating to me. So I used the first two um, gouache um, tutorials and dove into something in my neighborhood. Oh. So this is a passion flower vine. Can you see mm -hmm. This is so hard for me. Um, it was, it's completely obscuring the front of the house. And then I got up really close and actually did a, this is the actual size that it is. I have never tried painting like this. I've never tried documenting something like this. And I really had fun with it. It looks like you are having such a ball with this. It was great. Until You're the zooming in, zooming out, getting yeah. into yeah. that flowers business. And then playing with Get, getting the variations yeah. in, and uh, all the way down that stock. Oh, that is really yeah. exciting. That was really, really fun. Um, I gave myself permission to just make a messy page too. Yep. So it was with me playing with the gouache, playing with color, playing with how it looks and reminding myself that it dries in different tones over. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that was just so cool. Um, so then I also was challenged with, I'm gonna be teaching a class at for Sonoma State University this fall and again in the spring, some seminars called awesome. Naturalist Ed series where I'm teaching nature journaling out there on their preserve. And I was challenged to come up with something that they can use as an announcement photo. And um, for the spring, we we're gonna do some wildflowers and we were kind of thinking, well, what's blooming? And then I had to do it in a square for the to make the photograph right for her so I came up with this and I wanted to keep it simple because I don't want to intimidate people who are coming to these workshops so I just kept it simple yep yep you've got oh also this this little graphic shows so much you're yeah. diagramming things you're zooming in you're zooming out you've got uh Colors. the color variations you've got questions mm -hmm. attached to um to observations, uh, you've got to, you know, details. Um, this is, <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 and there's sort of, there's a hierarchy of, of thinking around it. This mm -hmm. little drawing just shows so much process in it. Mm -hmm. And part of what we're gonna be teaching is we're gonna be, I'm gonna be helping teach third through fifth grade teachers about incorporating nature journaling as numbers, words, and pictures yep. so that they are teaching their students and we're going to be doing math out there in nature. You know, I'm going to be showing them how the <laughs> nature journal can incorporate all those things of the three R's plus everything else they're teaching, science and everything um, in the nature journal. So, so I wanted to make something that's kind of simple, but shows some of those aspects and I'm really excited about it. Um, then this Day before yes, no, wait, today's Tuesday. Saturday, I taught a really short class for a California naturalist um, gathering that we had all oh. weekend up at Sugarloaf Ridge. Yeah. And um, I, at first, was going to plan on teaching nature journaling for like two hours. We we're going to go out on a trail, and I was just going to give some simple ideas about like tracing a leaf and getting started. Um, but it morphed into I only had 50 minutes, 5.0 to do a journal class. So I was kind of like, okay, well, whatever. So I had planned things, I had a curriculum and, and I had to throw all that out the window when I got there because I actually didn't even have 50 minutes. So the cool thing is we actually got out and moved. The other people who were doing present presentations were doing it on the deck of the visitor center and we weren't actually out in the park, which was kind of weird. So, Yep. I took everybody out on the trail and said, let's get out here and move. Let's look at things in front of our faces. And 
we didn't go very far because we didn't have to. We found an alder tree and I said, just pick up some leaves and trace them and just note down what you see, um, what you wonder, what it reminds you of, and just look deep at it. And they loved it. And we were out there for like 20 minutes. That was it. And everybody loved it. And I just had to give up all my expectations and my curriculum and my planning and just roll with it. And then I, I journaled during some of the other presentations. It was, that was really fun um, to just kind of get, take notes basically and, and draw things. And it just, it's just such therapy and such great learning practice. I just love this. Yeah. And, and when you think about the, um, you know, methods of, of teaching, mm -hmm. um, what you did is you got, even though, you know, you had this tiny little window, but you still got out of the way and let nature teach mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the, the sometimes, um, you know, what people will do is they, they will think like, I'm going to, like, I've only got this much time. I'm going to use all of this just to try to take your empty head and fill it with information. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, you know, like we could go out in the field, but then I'm not going to have much as much time to tell you things. And, you know, it's such a different, you know, like what, what is going to really connect people with, with place and with the natural world is what you did. And I felt like it was just such a little snippet of what I wanted to teach. And yet all of them came back to me for the next two days and said, what you taught was so cool. That was so neat because it got them to put their pen on paper or pencil on paper. And I had said, don't try to bring supplies, bring what you want if you've done this before, but all you need is a piece of paper and a number two pencil, make it a soft pencil and yeah. Don't worry about whether it's got lines or dots or anything on it. Just bring something to make a mark. That's right. And yeah, it was just the, was the, 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 the tools for entry into this are really minimal, really straightforward. And what you are teaching people there, what you're sharing with them, um, that is the stuff that really connects people with the world. Right. The other thing that we um, talked about was that all of us had taken the California naturalist class, a course, either um, somewhere locally. And the instructors do different things about incorporating nature journals into the course, but it's kind of one of those, you have to do this during the course kind of thing. And most of these <clears throat> folks that I was with were saying how they got really stuck in all the metadata that they had to put down, or they were stuck in the process. And I said, you know what? there are no rules. You can just, just start your blank page with the date and yes. where you are. And then if you want to put anything else down, like whether it's sunny or whether it's cold or, you know, what's going on with the weather, whatever you can, but don't be stuck with that. Just get yourself past the blank page by putting something down and then just whatever it is that you want to do, there are no rules and you will find your how, what your method is going to be. And I'm still developing that myself. What do I put down as what I want to say about the day before I even start drawing or something? So um, it was it was really great learning experience for me too. Yeah. The, the California natural system arises from the University of California. Mm -hmm. And the people who developed that program were strongly influenced by Joseph Grinnell right. and his approach to, um, to, to taking data. And Joseph Grinnell is very, very specific about, you know, where you write your name on the page, where you write the date, whether it is underlined, whether it has a wavy line under it, where you write the location, all this sort of stuff. Um, and um, I remember when I was taking a class at, uh, at, 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 at Cal, um, we're using that system. And like, if, if you didn't put the right kind of underline under, you know, the right term, you were, uh, they were all up in your business. <laughs> um, and 
I mean, what, what's cool about the system, Joseph Grinnell essentially invented hyperlinks. Um, the, he, he created a way to have um, uh, a, a hy hyperlinks in, in, in journals so that, you know, all of your, your notes about Encetina are all together. And it's really useful if you're then looking through the journals of a bunch of other biologists, you want to say like, what's everything that, you know, uh, that Stebbins found about Encetina, you can go to all those Encetina notes and they're all in one place. It's really, really cool. And they kind of cross reference each other. And when you took a specimen, then it jumps over here. And then, you know, and then you can find the specimen in the collection that relates to the the one that's mentioned in the journal over here and in the the kind of collection record you know it's it's all those things are kind of networked together that's really cool if you are going to be doing a bunch of research where you need all those things to be networked together for most people that's not the case and um, for some people it is, um, but for most people, that level of, you know, you, you, you totally get lost in where you're trying to like, oh, and then you do, you, then do you rewrite the date now that I've gone to the new page and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, you've got a system that very kind of quickly gets people to looking at the organism and not obsessing about what the page looks like mm -hmm. and what things are, you know, <clears throat> um, and, you know, you're, as you're saying, you're using words, pictures, and numbers, you know, by any means necessary, let's, it's all about that squirrel. And let's use the journal as a way to get us to connect with that squirrel on a deeper level. What I also found on Saturday was the people who said, oh, I, you know, I can't draw. But when you start by just saying simply take that leaf and trace it, they're drawing. Yep. It, it, it releases that inner critic of I'm not an artist, you know, and you're, just, you're letting nature do it for you. And that just gets it started. And I, and I told them too, another example I used was if you, if you want to express that leaf in writing a haiku go for it yeah or you can just you, you know you can just write what color you, it reminds you of and i actually demonstrated a little bit of painting because i've been starting to really let myself loose with the watercolor which is really hard but now my palette has started to look like this <laughs> because i'm mixing stuff that i never mixed before yep that's not even my field one um and that's very releasing, you know, to, to be okay with yellow plus red equals orange, but I'm not really sure that it's always going to be the same orange I'm going to come up with. Um, and yeah, it, this is so therapeutic and um, I'm also just delighted that you're going to be, you know, teaching this. Me too. I love to teach. And I, I wanted to say too, I've added, I've, I've tr I'm going to try to get the North Bay Journal Club kind of rolling some more. So I did put a date on for August 28th. Yes, where it's just a meetup at Sonoma Baylands. So I'm hoping that it, that kind of opens up for more people from the kind of Bay Area to be able to come to it, not just Sonoma County. And um, that place lends itself to a lot of opportunities. I'm not even sure what the tide level is going to be when we're going to be there, but there's plants, there's birds, there's snakes, there's raptors, there's all kinds of things, there's scenery. So I'm hoping that um, even if only one person comes out, that would be fun because I'm going to journal no matter what. Um, but I'm hoping that that some more of us can get together and, and share this journey that we're all on together. It's so much fun to be in fellowship with other people exploring and just deep geeking out like this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> deep geeking. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for sharing you. your whole process in 
your journey in the coolness of the fact that you were in Africa and seeing these huge animals and the coolness of being on the Galapagos, but also the intense experience of, of COVID and being sick and working through that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's really good to see you again. You too. Thanks for all of this today. Absolutely. Um, let's bounce over to Kate. Hey there, I haven't seen you for a while. And you've been now doing a bunch of teaching. Oops. Um, right, there, there we go. go. I wouldn't say a bunch. I've done a few little workshop things. Um, it's always the coordination and doing all that that takes a bunch of time and energy. So I'm slowly getting into my swing with that. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to do pencil miles, trying to teach myself as much as possible as always. And um, yeah, At the end of this month, I'll be back in California in uh, the Bay Area, living there for foreseeable future. So you will probably see me in person sometime soon. I, I'm looking forward to that. I was like, I was like, oh, you're going to visit California. Uh, California. Let's see. Oh, if I'm this moving is, back down. Gonna, no, let's, the, 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 there, there will be some deep geeking out happening. Yes, there will. This is, yeah. oh, this is, I'm, this is exciting. Yeah, the, the Bay Area just got a lot more nature journaly interesting. Yeah, I'm so I'll glad be, you'd be uh, coming here and playing with us. You know where, well, San Juan Tista says we're like, you're going to go drive uh, to the pinnacles you pass through there. Yeah. Yeah, so I live up there uh, right by Steinbeck Canyon um, in San Juan Canyon. So it's a great birding spot. Um, my grandfather likes to feed all the birds. So it's like a bird swarm up there if you want to come visit. And do you have um, Faina people is? No, what? F do you have Faina people is hanging out there in your oak trees? Faina people is. Uh, what's the common name? Um, they're silky flycatchers. They're um, <clears throat> these cool sort of glossy black birds with red eyes who like eating mistletoe berries and pooping them out. No, we don't. But yeah, so even on, I filled up uh, two notebooks. I'm now working on my third, so I'm doing one every month. But I'll kind of do a fast flip through. So um, well, I, I, actually, the um, oh, uh, do, do do we want to um, on Thursday take some deep time doing a slower look at those, or do you feel like doing a a, a fast flip, or just sort of giving us a taste now? I can give you a taste now with a quick little flip through. And if you want to see more, I'm happy to bring okay. it out. So we, we will want to see more. I know that. Yeah. But, I um, think so... good to show you some like pencil mile progressions and we got so many like awesome gaps basically. So this is sort of beginning of uh, June sketchbook. Let's see. Can you see that pretty well? Yes. 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 Yeah. Hummingbirds in flight. And I like the. Um, uh the 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 light background of the dark background by the light bird oh nice yeah that's a trick i'm using been really enjoying plant families and our food um nice. making great notes from that let's see what else i've got in here um oh here's from my uh virtual birding safari oh fun nice soft pencil there yeah yeah, I was using that just because, you know, it really forces you to practice. Um, let's see, what else do I have? So I went to the Woodland Park Zoo, and here's some rough sketches I did while I was there. Oh, oh fun, fun, fun. Isn't zebra butt cool? It's great, especially because you have to think about wrapping those lines to give it yep. a curvature. Zebra butt is su such a cool butt. Yeah, went back and redid some of the pictures I took or sketched from the pictures I took on my trip. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun with that. It's really fun. Let's see what else I've got. Um, Oh, I did a big 18 mile ride through the backcountry and brought my nature journal along with me. Oh, 
<laughs> um, of over uh, was this a multi multi day ride? Nope, we did in one day. We brought uh, pack mules and chainsaws and cleared out this trail that hadn't been in use. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it was a good time. My sister, who is not an experienced rider, managed to ride 18 miles bareback. So kudos to her. Um, I used the saddle, but also I had to carry our lunch. So I think that makes it fair. And and the chainsaw. And no, no, the mules had the chainsaw. So oh, okay. I, but I, I I should have guessed that you um know your way around a chainsaw that's that's impressive someone like me would cut my leg off yeah i do a lot of work with uh, backcountry horsemen and um yeah Ooh, look at these fish oh i just went on the ambari uh instagram accounts and they have lots of weird deep sea things on there to draw from reference um let's see Oh, here's uh, some of the regulars at Pencil Miles. Love your line variation. On each other. Yep. Out to a yak farm that a friend of mine was working at, and I just sat there for about four hours growing the yaks. Wow. Who knew that a yak farm existed? That's cool. Yeah. Apparently, they're becoming more popular uh, as meat animals because they're less intensive grazers than cattle. And... Um, Apparently, they have really lean, tasty meat. So that oh, works really well in the Pacific Northwest because they will eat the Himalayan blackberry plants, which are invasive. You, you say they, they don't or they do? Oh, they do. Oh, so good for them. So they browse kind of the same way that goats do, but um, then they can be used for milk, meat, and fiber. So a very versatile, hardy animal. Mm -hmm. I did some more yak. Work. Oh, these yak are... I mean, what a cool shape. They've got such a big hunch. And look at that shedding one. Yeah. Well, it's funny, there's two types. There's the regular black and white and then the royal yaks, which are black and white. They came to North America because they kept getting gifted to like Canadian prime ministers by like Indian, Tibetan and uh, Thai like foreign ministers. Oh. And so they just give them yaks. Eventually, the zoos were like, we can't take any more yaks. So then they start being privately bred. And ranchers or select ranchers really enjoyed them. So, yeah. Ooh. Oh, nice. Ch Did check you... out breaking the box here. Yeah, I love doing that because it's oh. like dynamic and three dimensional. Well, well, broken box. That's really fun. It's one of my favorite tricks. Um, here's some nature journaling. From, I went running and tried to just take pictures of everything interesting I saw and come back and draw it. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, so I have uh, practiced some landscapes from one of the places I was at in South Carolina, trying to work on like creating perspective and stuff and depth mm -hmm. in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Got really into alligators. Oh. So I've been doing oh. a lot of alligator pencil miles um yeah oh, oh, these are these have such so, these are so solid i um let, let me just i'm gonna flip to this uh, i was drawing a, a croc in um in kenya and just realized like i do not know my way around this animal at all I actually watched your video on drawing crocodiles to get better at it, and I just did some anatomy stuff. Here's some American dippers and tufted puffins. Oh, oh, that's lovely. And let's see. I went sailing on my friend's boat, and I just, there was no wind, so I just sat there drawing the whole time. <laughs> um, plant families in our food. Uh, tried to draw otters after I listened to a podcast about what little criminals they are. Oh, oh that's fun. Um, let's see. There's just some little practice stuff. I'm trying to figure out how to make watercolor bleed into itself nicely and what it can do. Um, do little studies like that, just to, to, you know, give yourself, sometimes people um yeah. once they've been painting for a while they don't give themselves permission just to do a little experimental studies that's such a good idea 
Oh yeah, and Yves, yes, Colette has seen otters in Monterey. Uh, so then some fish pencil miles. I took your class or, or uh, an old video on how to draw fish and then I just tried to do a bunch of um, fish pencil miles and take notes on like oh, how man. fish work. I yeah. Think there are a few parts of that class. So I did stuff on like fish perspective and the whole like light at different uh, depths. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it's very cool. So I did a bunch of fish, trying to get better at that. Oh, um, oh so many pencil miles happening here. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Oh, and sh those shark forms. Oh yeah. So then I started doing pencil miles for reptiles. And at oh. first they were a little messy. These ones oh. I was trying to do while we were doing our class with Parker. Um, they kept getting better. I started doing more with like uh, under shading, which you'll see in some of the paintings I'm going to show you later. Just random sketches. Uh, let's see. Did some lizard pencil miles. I just drew my way through California Herps. Isn't that a great website? It is amazing. Did that. Did a little request for my friend for some history stuff. Uh, more lizards. more herbs yeah as as the as the form as, as as a reptile curves towards you um it can get so confusing yeah it really can i've been working on that because it's really focused and i've been working oh, on yeah basically putting uh scale wraps on blobbies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah basically just a ton of technical stuff but it's really helped because yep you know oh oh yeah that is those are really solid turns of the form yeah i've been trying to just really think about things in three dimensions and then really work on putting in values um here's some pictures from the uh marine life center <sighs> oh fun that's really really fun and i tried to do some stuff that would work as like more graphic things i'm trying to figure out how to like make stuff that i can uh make prints or like stickers mm -hmm. of since people really like stickers and trying to figure out how to make stuff that would work like that i did pencil miles for um leatherback sea turtles oh yes yeah and then i went and spent three hours out in the pasture watching the horses, trying to draw them while they had their heads down. I like how you're simplifying the shadows here. You've got these shadows are like really clear, crisp shapes. That's really what we see on the animals. People tend to over blend their shadows. Yeah, and especially for stuff, just having a really sort of defined definite yeah. shadow seems to help quite a bit. And just some birds from bird pixel or Instagram or somewhere. Just practice birds, crocodile or alligator pencil miles, plant families, uh, more alligators. I was listening to Carl Hyacin books, which are basically about people in Florida doing crazy things, usually involving some form of ecoterrorism and a lot of crocodiles, or not crocodiles, alligators or plot points. So I'm guessing <laughs> that's what inspired this because there are more. But wait, there's, oh, oh, wait, wait. I love the eyes above the water croc. Yeah. Eyes up croc here. Oh, fun. And even more, because of course. Because, because you can. Yeah. Then I did a little landscape while I was waiting for someone at a hike. I'm really working on doing water. I'll show you in my next notebook, which there isn't much of, but I'll show you in ways. Um, more landscapes. Oh, that is really fun. Squid in preparation for my squid class. Oh, 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 wait, 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 just, just, just come back to this. Oh, get out of town. We are, you, don't you just want to cuddle with that? Oh, I guess that is a cuttlefish, so never mind. <laughs> um, that, once again, I got on Instagram and just started, like, drawing anything that was at all natural. Yeah. Um... That's just words. Oh yes, and then here's the notes from the squid class or cephalopod class that I did. Um, I tried to focus on showing action stuff 
more than like trying to make a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So oh, man. I didn't quite get the whole art lesson that I wanted out of that, but I was still pretty happy with it. And then here's the horse I'm working with. And I'll show you really quick my current sketchbook, which I took with me on a three-day three -day cruise through the San Juan Islands, which I didn't realize that it was going to take me so long to sail from Bellingham to Friday Harbor. I thought it would take maybe four to six hours. It took us 12. So <laughs> I had lots of time to draw. Yeah. Oh, ooh, I like I like how you're showing that distant to near water with those dark yeah. horizontal shapes. I was really working on that. And um, these were all just sort of done out in the field. Cormorant forms. Yeah. Oh, orca. We didn't see the orcas. My sister was like, hey, if you draw them, maybe they'll come. So I tried. If you draw it, they will come. <laughs> yeah. That. Just trying to capture like little images from the trip. Mm -hmm. And then I did some studies of trying to draw um, water and show movement on water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Oh, and then we went to the, um, the whale museum and they had all these great bones. So I took some pictures. I was with people. So I uh, couldn't take quite as long as I'd like to draw, but I did some stuff. My uncle added some doodles on my... Uh, yeah. <laughs> His kids caught some sculpins with uh, their fishing poles, which I didn't love how they were handling the animals, but I did manage to sort of like toss them back in when we weren't looking. Oh, good. Them, so, yeah, my, uh, Amelia and Carolyn would be really proud of you. Um, yeah. Because, like, here's the thing I like dock fouling and I'll use like a net and then put something in a bucket. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I'm okay with fishing if you're going to eat the thing, but just to torment animals, it seems kind of. Yeah yeah i don't know and yeah then just some fun little pencil mile sketches with our logo for my friend's uh ultra marathon nice my friend's dog at a dinner party <laughs> and some pigeon oh, oh. Ha, ha. oh this this uh the foreshortening on that that far wing right uh, really nuanced really nuanced then just some bird pencil miles Ooh, oh your angles your negative shapes are so powerful in here i love that line variation too yeah i did another coming out of the box thing with the yeah media. so i was trying to like look in for like what can i make stickers of and stuff mm -hmm. and I just did some pencil miles with photos on instagram Some more studies. It's amazing. This horse, his coat color is exactly Potter's pink. <laughs> there he is. But yeah, that's that sketchbook. And I have a few paintings I did, and then I think we'd move on to someone else. But so I think I just grabbed the ones that you haven't seen yet. Here's some woodpeckers from the trip. And again, those white and black lines really kind of you get to carve the form with those yeah so a little out of order from like day i did them i was trying to work on making more like cohesive watercolors mm -hmm. little, um carolina parakeet mm. um, i worked on doing underpainting um with like shadow violet first like you do for the birds and did that to really like punch in the darks to yeah. get the value before i put color on <clears throat> i did the same thing with the san francisco garter snake oh oh this is really exciting yeah i was trying to do something where you do like a little bit of like narrative into your bird painting so i got some american dippers oh. I tried habitat they're hunting what they do Oh, what fun. Yeah. Worked on some trees. Um, let's see. Nice sense of depth in that. Here's some roadrunners. Do you know um, the paintings of Luis Agassiz Fuertes? Uh, I don't think so, no. 
take a look at some of Fuerte's stuff. Um, the uh, some of these bird drawings that were yes, this is you're you're gonna you're gonna you're you're gonna enjoy geeking out with some Fuertes. Okay, I'll take a look. Yeah, so green heron. I was just looking at the green heron the other day. Mm. That that rusty red is so much fun to put in They're there. Really neat. And there's a hooded oriole, some tilaha poppies. Oh, what what fun! Um, what else do I have? I took one of those landscape uh, sketches and turned it into a painting. I'm trying to like figure out how to do watery and stuff. Uh, do uh, water and stuff in watercolor with reflections and keep mm -hmm. it neat. This is an older one, but I was trying to figure out how to do like reflecting light underwater and like. Oh, that is that is so, so hard to do. Yeah, the, yeah, the reflections on shiny surfaces. Um, yeah. We get the critter out of the water and we see all the reflections, but then you see it in the water, and we don't have those sharp highlights. It's really yeah. weird. I'm trying oh. to take on like painting projects that are like a little bit ambitious, just so I have to really like push the envelope. <laughs> I know they're not going to turn out like mm -hmm. as amazing as if I stayed in my comfort zone, but I'm like, well, at this point. I really want to focus on like getting better instead of like creating perfect work. So that I've got another alligator. Of course you do. Oh, I do. And I've just got two more. I have a. Well, your herbs are place. just oh, see yeah they're there with those sharp highlights on the shell. You really get the sense of um, the sort of wet glossy thing. Uh, yeah. That's. Wonderful texture. Well, one reason I've been doing the herps is because they don't have forms that like I automatically recognize. Like with a horse, I know basically how a horse is put together. Mm -hmm. um, and so my brain will really start to go like, oh yes, we know how to make a horse. Whereas with an alligator, it's like, oh, or a turtle or something, my brain doesn't already know how to make one. And so it's a mm -hmm. lot more beneficial for me to like learn because I have to. Yeah look at anatomy, I have to look at shapes instead of just going like, oh, I know how to make this. I know what all the parts are. I'm going to try and put them together. So it's harder, but I think it yields a better reward as far as like, you know, the steeper learning curve. Mm -hmm. And then whenever I come back to something, I can apply those skills that I've really like forced myself to use because I know I'm not going to use uh, the technique of like looking for negative spaces when I'm drawing horses legs because my brain's automatically going to go oh I know what they're supposed to do I'm just going to put them in and so if I can take myself out of that comfort zone remove that crutch then uh yeah yeah that's um yeah it, it's interesting kind of we, we we get to a place where we know something really well and then we can stop looking at it and then we kind of stagnate and our drawings start to look like the way we think it should look. And then yeah. at some point you come back and you start looking at the thing again and you go like, oh. Like, so the, the, the challenge of finding something novel in the familiar is often a yeah. really good one, you know, to try to get yourself to look at something that you've seen before in a way that's new. Hmm. Thank you so much for, for sharing those. I'd love to spend a little bit more time on those at another time. Yeah, of course. Also, I had another cool opportunity come up where, um, oh shoot, what's his name? There's a uh, painter who I think is one of the instructors for um, for the CSUMB program. Is it uh, Amado Bakar? Mm -hmm. You know him? He needed a studio assistant, assistant. So I've been messaging him and I'm hoping that I can land that job when I get back to California this fall. So that's fantastic. That would be really cool. And yeah. is, is he based near Monterey? Um, yeah, he's in Santa Cruz. All right. Yeah. Um, wow. So wish me luck. You know? Good luck on that. Good yeah, luck thank on that. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Kate. It's great to see you again. Thank you for having me. It's always really fun. Um, and let's uh, jump across the ocean and see, visit our friend Ray Bonto. Sorry you've had to wait so long, but we've got... Uh, just a backlog of cool things that everybody's been showing. Yeah. Um, sadly, I haven't been, I haven't done anything. Uh, I'm in a break, so it's best not to force things. Um, but yeah, I like to make um, And I was just sketching along. 
Oh, oh, oops. Oh, all right. I like your, uh, your tortoise shapes there. Yep, there's the mating ones. <laughs> oh, really well yeah. done. Well done. And the, the, the frigate birds, the, the beaks on those things are just so outrageously long, aren't they? Yeah. You feel like you're drawing it wrong when you're making a beak that long. Mm -hmm. I was just drawing snapshots. There's a mountain. It just reminded me of that one time I was in the Himalayan foothills and I was, we were lodged in a hotel above the clouds and we were supposed to see Kanchenjunga, uh, third tallest mountain. And mm -hmm. yeah, we were in India, near China. So, um, um, yeah, but it was always covered with clouds. Then one day, I was just <laughs> sleeping and then it was, hey, get up! Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> the mountain comes out. And then it ran up and yeah, we saw it for, got a glimpse of it for one day. Yeah. That's, that's, oh, that's fun. I, I, I like the, uh, just the, the way you've, you've taken those, those drawings and just you've, you've simplified and picked out really kind of key basic forms. That's fun. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. It's good to see you again. The, uh, I, I hope that, um, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're right. Sometimes we, it's when you feel you need to take a break from anything that you're doing, take a break from that mm -hmm. and, and don't feel guilty about it. Um, and then when you want to get back into it, sometimes it takes, you have to be really intentional about it because you were now, you're now out of a habit. Um, but, uh, but by then just sort of rigorously kind of getting yourself to do like, I'm going to do a few more and a few more and a few more. Have you, you've, you had a friend for a while that you were doing some, um, adventuring and exploring and journaling with, have the two of you been able to meet up anymore? Yeah, we were meeting up at another place, which has so much of fun stuff that we don't bring our nature journals. Oh. <laughs> uh, Good stuff to, to uh, sort of nature discoveries. Yeah, we, we were wading in a river and um, that's yeah, fun. Playing, playing splashes um, and trying not to get ourselves wet. Um, oh, so, but, but the advantage is once you get yourself wet, you're already wet and then you can and, just yeah. absolutely be in the fun. Yeah. The, um, um, if I'm in a place sometimes where I'm really trying not to get dirty, sometimes I'll say to myself like, what if I just kind of get, let myself get really dirty? And then it opens up all sorts of possibilities because sometimes I'm thinking like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to get wet. But then once you're there, then sometimes you have a lot more fun afterwards. Yeah. Um, but we went swimming. Um, so yeah, we, and then we found this dead catfish. Oh. Um, it was that big. Um, it had like it was white with like black blotches and it had some whiskers. It was dead. Um, I thought it was a plank of wood, but it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. It, it's really cool to get a close look at at, at something like that. Things that like we're, with with fish where we, you know, often if we, you're just sort of seeing it from the top, it's moving really fast, but being able to kind of, you know, uh, you know, carefully kind of geek out on like, like, look at, you know, these, these weird whisker structures, look at the, or the eyes or, or just saying to yourself, like, you know, how does the, this gill slit, um, how is it really oriented? What is it? My problem is when I don't have my journal, I'll tend to kind of look at things in a way that I then don't remember as well. And I, then I kind of get back to my journal and I'm like, what was I looking at? But yeah, sometimes when you're, you are playing in a creek, 
um, is good to leave the, 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 the journal behind. Um, also, I've yeah. uh, also dropped my journal into tide pools. Oh, no. Mm. Turns out tide pools and journal. Oh, there's such cool critters around, but uh, yeah, tide pools eat your journals. But it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thanks. So, um, I, I haven't sent it yet, but um, in the next few days, um, I do plan on making it to the post office. And I've got a little uh, gift for you from Africa. So uh, that will Aww. be. Um, I thought it was over there that uh, something that was uh, made by a, a Maasai that I thought you'd think was cool. Um, good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks. You bet. You take care. Um, so, folks, thank you so much for being here with us. Let's see, it is now 1 16. We started at 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 11. So that's three hours and 15 minutes that we've been geeking out here today. Um, it's, it's really fun to see uh, all of you. Um, and thanks, thank you folks for such uh, uh, generous and thoughtful sharing of your observations and thoughts. Um, thank you again, Vea for uh, helping us manage the meetings and for all this, the workshops and things that you are doing um, to help support this community. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Um, take care of yourselves. Let's take care of each other and the planet. Um, I think that, again, paying attention is such an important part of um, connecting and then caring. And uh, the journaling process is is an important part of that. You it looks like you had a thought just a moment ago. Okay, it's kind of it's kind of random, but you know we have to end on a humor note. Oh, yeah. um, so I have some a little bit unfortunate news. You know that lovely joke we like to tell about the octopi. As I learned from um, from Kate's um, pod, uh, not podcast YouTube with uh, Dr. McAnulty, we have to change it. Wait, wait, which, which, which joke about the octopi? Okay, I'll just tell you it. Right. Okay. Um, so speaking about that research, there's been some research that has been done on squid. How many tickles does it take to get a squid <laughs> to laugh? Oh, tentacles. Because octopi do not have tentacles. Squid do though. Yeah, octopi only have arms. The squids are the ones with the tentacles. Oh, what is the difference between a tentacle? Uh, maybe should we bring um, Kate in on this too? Yes, and I can also show the notes I took. Um, wait, so there is a difference arms. between arms and tentacles. Arms and tentacles. Whoa! Those are great notes. Thank you. Wasn't Sorry. It, okay, so wait, arms have the suckers all the way down, right? And then tentacles. Are like these long little wisps with the suckers only here at the end, only at these tassels. Crazy, right? Wow, I never knew that. Arms and tentacles. Wow. Um, Sorry, <laughs> I just had to share that before I forgot. Wow, no, no, that that that's that's good to know. I I've been I've been calling arms tentacles for um, I, I don't know how long. Me too. Uh, there we go. So, yes. Like, arms are the arms are like huge, strong things. Um. Yeah, as even I said, they have suckers all the way down, and tentacles are these flexible, I don't know, jelly things that have, yeah, as you said, only one sucker. So, huh. um, yeah, they. Easy to differentiate, but not many people know that. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've been, I've been, who knew? Yeah, um, e, e says, what about cuttlefish? Yep, they have um, eight tentacles. Oh, okay. Uh, and <laughs> no, 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 I mean, eight arms and two ten tentacles. Okay. They're extra cool. Um, yeah. That's cool. All yeah. right. Well, and now you know.
Mm-hmm. All right, everybody. It is time for lunch here in sunny California. And wherever you are, I hope you're having a good day. Um, take care of each other. Let's be kind. Um, and remember that when, 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 whenever you're in doubt, you can always kind of go back to that as a sort of fail-safe plan. And generally speaking, it's going to steer you well. Um, look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Bye. Bye-bye.